Ready, Al? Ready. Yep. You ready, Jane? Okay. Let's take our seats. Let's actually stand up. Uh, tonight we have Jane Howard accompanying us on the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mrs. Howard. <clears throat> Just a couple of remarks tonight. Um, Mary Dice, one of our own, has an art show. It's upstairs in the hallway. You may want to go up and look at it. It's going to be there for the next week or so. So you can go up and look at Mary's artwork during the break. Um, <clears throat> some of it's really nice. I like some of them. And the town hall staff asked that we pick up our chairs at the end of the night and pick the things off the floor and put them in the recycling bins on the way out. Uh, that way we're going to be more green and make Mr. Jamison happy because we're recycling this stuff instead of throwing it out. Any more town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Please rise. Repeat after me. Aye. Aye. What's your name? John Pledge? To attend all scheduled town meetings. To participate fully and fairly and evaluate all matters before town meeting. To vote in the best interest of the town with respect thereto. To support free and open speech. I will treat others with mutual respect in spite of a conflicting opinions. Pledge to conduct myself in a civil manner that is becoming of an elected town meeting member. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon me as a town meeting member for the town of Arlington in accordance with the bylaws, the Town Manager Act, and the general laws of the Commonwealth. So help me God. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Dunn. It is moved that if all business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant of the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 7th at 8 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Any announcements or resolutions? Mr. Marr. Okay, we'll go like this. Um, I'm a member of the uh, committee that uh, makes up the Sims Medical Use Nonprofit Corporation. 
uh, which is an entity established by the Supreme Judicial Court when the Sims Hospital and uh, uh, essentially uh, was taken over by Leahy Clinic. There was a substantial amount of money left uh, from uh, excess Medicare reimbursements, and along with Charlie Lyons, a former uh, Board of Selectmen and current superintendent of uh, Shawshank Valley Technical High School, and Dr. Mike Foley, award each year a certain amount of money. Uh, we have currently about a million dollars in the fund, and we give about 10% 10, 10 away each year. Many town departments have been uh, submitted requests for proposals and received grants in the past, such as the Council on Aging um, and the Department of uh, Human uh, Services, uh, as well as uh, Minuteman Healthcare and like organizations. In tomorrow's advocate will be the third round announcement of requests for proposals, and if anybody cares to have more information about that, uh, please see me at the break or otherwise. Uh, my phone number is in the ad tomorrow on the legal notices. Um, and uh, uh, again, this is the third year, and uh, we're uh, looking uh, to provide funds for local health care organizations. Thank you, Mr. Thank Moderator. you, Mr. O'Connor. James O'Connor, Precinct 19. In the um, number of years I've been the chair of our precinct, I've never had to do this, but one of our members isn't here tonight and has not yet been sworn in. The first night of town meeting, he took ill, and two nights later, he found out he had stage four pancreatic cancer. This is Mark Butler, used to sit in the front, very quiet, unassuming fellow. Um, several people have known, and thanks to those that have taken time, they've made a visit to his house or brought him something to cheer him up a little bit. So I'd ask you to keep him in your prayers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam? Michelle DeRocher, Precinct 19. Please join the Arlington Conservation Commission and the Arlington Land Stewards for a cleanup of Meadowbrook Park on Saturday, May 5th from 9 a.m. to noon, rain or shine. Every year, volunteers are surprised at what has washed down Mill Brook, including balls of every kind, plastic bottles, tires, carpet scraps, baskets of plastic flowers, and shopping carts, to name a few highlights. S the group will be meeting on Brooks Avenue in Pleasant Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Please bring um, garbage, garbage can for hauling stuff, boots, gloves, long pants, and expect to get muddy. So come join us. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Tosti. So let you know that uh, we'll be taking up uh, the Minuteman articles, articles 44 through 46, next Wednesday, a week from today on uh, May 9th. Uh, as you know, the superintendent of Minuteman has to visit like 16 different town meetings, so that's the time. So the first thing uh, Wednesday uh, night, I will plan to ta take that up so we can get those articles. Uh, budget uh, Materials will be um, on your seats or in the back of the town hall on uh, Monday evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Good evening, Kathleen Pody, Superintendent of Schools. Um, since there's a strong likelihood that the school budget will come up this evening, I wanted you to know that uh, I will be here for questions as well as Diane Johnson, our CFO. However, I ask your indulgence to do the, the school report next Wednesday. I have asked to I'll present that report at the beginning of the meeting on May 9th. I don't think you need to sit and listen to my voice all for that whole presentation. So thank you. I just wanted you to be aware of that before we got to the budget section. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. Any other announcements, resolutions? Seeing none. Um, any reports to be received? Mr. Gilligan. Uh, we actually have to take three off the table. Mr. Tosti. Move that Article 3 be taken from the table. All in favor of removing 3 from the table, please say yes. yes. Opposed? It's off the table. Mr. Gilligan. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer, Town Meeting Member from Precinct 13. Uh, I ask that the report of the Treasurer to the 2012 Annual Town Meeting be received. All in favor of receiving the report of the Treasurer, please say yes. Yes. So received. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I trust Town, town Meeting will, will find it informative. Uh, there is some relatively new information, and if anyone has any questions, I'm available tonight or any night of town meeting. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Any other reports? Mr. Tosti. Move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor? Opposed? Okay, that brings us back to Article 29, which was postponed to this evening. Mr. Dunn. Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dan Dunn from Board of Selectmen. Uh, Mr. Moderator, there's going to be three speakers that will fit well under 10 minutes. I'm going to talk for a few seconds. And then uh, the chairman of the Board of Assessors, Jim Doherty, is going to speak for a few minutes. And then one of the proponents, um, a main proponents of this article, uh, Senator Ken Donnelly, is going to speak for a couple minutes. Um, just speaking briefly for the Selectmen, uh, the, the current deferment rate floats, but it doesn't float low enough in the current environment. I don't think we anticipated, or th this meeting anticipated uh, such a low uh, and long period of interest rates. Uh, in order to make this deferment a more viable option for our seniors, we think that the rate should be permitted to go lower. Uh, the other benefit of the particular rate mechanism was chosen is that it's floating and will automatically adjust upwards and downwards as uh, the federal rate changes. So from your orange book, our, um, orange, the, it's Article 29, if you just want to give it a read. Um, Mr. Doherty. Jim Doherty, Chairman of the Board of Assessors, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 2. Thank you, Dan. I've been asked tonight to just briefly touch upon what the qualifications in the uh, various um, limits and qualifications are for the uh, tax deferral, which we're speaking about in this article. Basically, um, we have various types of property tax exemptions which reduce your property tax. That could be veterans, blind persons, two types of elderly and surviving spouse as well as widows. Those actually reduce your property tax bill. The exemption we're speaking about tonight does not technically reduce your property tax. It simply defers it to a later date. Currently, you need to be 65 years of age or older to qualify for this particular exemption. You may defer, defer a portion of the tax or the entire tax. You can also uh, defer your water and sewer if you'd like. Currently, the income limit is 30000 There's another article um, that will come before you, and um, that will uh, potentially increase that amount. There are no asset restrictions on this um, deferral, unlike some of the other exemptions. Um, as I just previously mentioned, the requirement solely addresses the income. A couple of the other criteria in here is that you have to have a primary residence in Massachusetts for 10 years. You must have owned and occupied a piece of property for five years anywhere in Massachusetts. The, there's another restriction, and we don't really see it come into play too often, neither do many other communities, but essentially, by deferring your property tax, it can never exceed 50% of the value, the assessed value of the property. Uh, again, we haven't seen that. It would take a, a fair amount of time before that would kick in, but it is something that people should be aware of before they enter in this. The other thing is that um, the tax, as well as the interest, needs to be paid back once the property is transferred or the ownership, uh, or the owner, I should say, uh, passes away. At that time, and I couldn't find it specifically addressed in the statute, but at some point after that, it, if it is not addressed, then the interest rate would go up to 16%, uh, which is the statutory um, interest rate. This exemption, as I mentioned earlier, no other exemption can you receive two. So if you're a veteran and you're an elderly person, you can't receive both. This particular exemption would be net of any other exemption. 
So anyone who currently receives a property tax exemption that I described earlier simply would still, if they qualify, be entitled to that. They would net that out, and then the net amount would be the amount that would be deferred. The Board of Assessors did not actually take a vote on this. Uh, we felt, quite frankly, that we should defer to our chief uh, investment officer or the FinCom who actually invests our money. Um, there was discussion at the meeting as to uh, the selectmen's recommended uh, vote, and um, there was concern about bringing the rate down too much. Historically, I've been on the Board of Assessors for 18 years. Um, we have led the charge to increase property tax exemptions. We do support the whole idea of what we're trying to achieve here, um, but as I stated earlier, we would defer um, to someone else to actually decide what they believe um, a prudent interest rate should be. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ken Donnelly, the State Senator, representing the 4th Middlesex District. And uh, thank, I want to thank the Selectmen and the Finance Committee uh, for taking up this article, Article 29. Um, as, uh, as Selectman Dunn said, this was an issue that uh, I had looked at. Last spring, we held a, a forum, elderly forum. It was the Selectmen uh, with the chair at the time, Clarissa Rowe, uh, myself, the assessors, and uh, we did it at the Council of Aging. The, the room was full with elderly residents from Arlington. And uh, the, what we heard loud and clear is many of them were struggling and needed help. Uh, they, had, uh, they looked at the exemptions. Exemptions in many cases were too low. And in a lot of uh, cases, uh, the, the exemptions we had and the help we had uh, wasn't quite enough to provide them the help we needed. Um, also, uh, I do my uh, office hours every month at the Council of Asian age in, in every community. Um, I had a gentleman in Wuben come up to me, a veteran, that uh, had actually uh, outlived his pension with him and his wife, uh, and his Social Security was very small, and he was struggling to keep, uh, keep up his house and to stay in his home. Uh, I met in Arlington with a gentleman that was also a vet um, that lived in Arlington for 60 years, and his Social Security, again, was very little, and his, uh, his money that he, again, the money he put away was small. So he, would, they were having a, he was having a very difficult time making ends meet. So it made us take a look at some of these exemptions and what we can do for our, our elderly residents, especially when we had an override that I think was, uh, uh, it was good for this community, but in some cases, some of the people that are trying to make ends meet uh, made it very difficult. So this issue, Again, I think that Jim is absolutely correct. This is a deferral. This is not a gift. Uh, upon death or transfer, the money is uh, in full. And it, at that time, if you don't put the money in full, uh, the interest rate kicks in. Uh, we're taking a look at that also, but that would kick in immediately. Um, also, when you look at the interest rate, the interest rate was 6%. Uh, this is not a financial issue. This is a social issue. Do we want to keep our elderly in their homes? In this case, the gentleman I was talking to, 60 years in the town of Arlington, wants to stay in his home. That's where he grew up. That's where he lives. Uh, and we're not saying it's for nothing. The interest rate would be somewhere around one and three quarter percent. And actually, I would probably would love to be able to give him that money and get one and three quarter because it's a lot more money than I'm getting for my money in the bank today. Um, so. 6% is obviously was way too high. I think the Finance Committee looked at this issue and they come up with a really good solution. I support that 100%. The uh, Board of Selectmen, I applaud them. I support that 100%. And I hope that we can pass this and think about uh, our uh, elders that uh, want to stay in Arlington. I think make Arlington a wonderful community and give them a little assistance. So thank you. Thank you. Is that it, Mr. Dunn? Thank you. We're still ready. Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Mr. Moderator, I have an amendment to the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, shall I read it, or do um, I need to? Do the, everyone have it? Is, does the crowd have it? 
Okay. Now we can waive the reading, just tell us what it does. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The amendment I'm proposing is to keep the uh, formula for calculating the interest rate as it is. Indeed, the interest rate floats already. Um, what, it, what my amendment would do is still allow the interest rate to float, but it would set a floor of 4% rather than 6%. And uh, Mr. Good, if you have the handout that I had distributed, would you mind putting it up on the screen? I'd like to talk a little bit about the table at the bottom of that handout. Um, prior to 2006, Arlington was charging 8% on the property tax deferrals. And right now we're charging a rate that's based on the 10-year treasury bond. Uh, and it's set at that bond, and as I said, it is, um, has a floor of 6% and a cap at 8%. That 8% cap is established by state law. The selectman's proposal would reduce the interest rate um, and use a different index, the federal discount rate, add a percent to that, and that's where that 1.75% comes from. And as I said, what I'm proposing to do is keep the formula as it is except put a 4% floor on. So essentially tonight you have three options. You can vote for the selectman's recommended vote as it is, and currently you would have an interest rate of about 2%, actually 1.75. You can vote for my amendment and have a current interest rate of 4%, or you can leave it as is and have a current interest rate of 6%. Um, Mr. Moderator, there, are a lot, there have been a lot of articles this year that seem to repeat things from the past, and indeed this, this is one of them. Uh, we took up the question of the interest rate on the property tax deferral in 2006, and I thought um, be, because we are um, essentially discussing the same thing, it would be instructive to look at some of the comments that were made at that time, because I think they're still applicable. Um, and so what I thought I would do is summarize some of those comments. I'm going to leave out my own, because at that time I was talking a lot about trying to get the town to raise the income limit to $40,000. And instead of 30,000, and obviously I had failed at that. And just to be clear, um, in case you didn't, you missed it when Mr. Doherty spoke. Indeed, we have voted to increase the limit to uh, $52,000 for the, um, the current income limit. So, um, at the time we changed to the current formula, the board of selectmen had recommended a fixed rate of 6%. There was a fear that that rate was too low, and that. Um, that the, fl the rate needed to float as interest rates increased. So the Finance Committee proposed a substitute motion that had the floating rate. And let me give you a few uh, of the statements they made at the time. They chose the 10-year uh, T-bill note because they said it was a, the benchmark for many adjustable rates, including home mortgages and corporate bonds, and that it was a number that was readily available. And they noted that the interest rate of the 10-year T-note has historically only has been only slightly higher than the most easily available conservative investment, a commercial certificates of deposit. This rate can therefore reduce the likelihood that a taxpayer would take advantage of the deferral program as an investment vehicle while still charging a fair rate. The fear was that if you, or, and still is, that if you set the rate too low, people will defer paying their taxes um, and then invest that money at a higher interest rate than the rate they're paying to borrow. Another point that they made that was very important is that the rate accrued on deferred taxes does not impact the number of seniors eligible for the deferral, and it has no effect on the stated goal of helping seniors remain in their homes as property tax rates increase. The, the accrued interest only impacts the net proceeds upon the sale of properties, whether by homeowners or their heirs. And it's important to point out that for anyone who takes advantage of this program, they pay nothing on those taxes uh, while those taxes are being deferred. The interest simply accrues, they, but they don't pay it until the property is transferred or until they pass away and, and the, the um, taxes are paid as part of settling the estate. Um, so indeed, the important thing that town meeting did, or the most important you know, um, item in increasing el eligibility was to increase the limit on the income, and that's what we voted on Monday night. And again, I checked the statistics. By raising the income limit to $52,000, the, 
the number of se senior household covers, covered rose from about 50% to 70%, probably higher than that, because my numbers are out of date. So um, I just want to reiterate that, the, as Mr. Darty said, there is no uh, asset test for this. Um, a very large fraction of Arlington seniors would be able to participate, and they would pay nothing until the time that the um, that they, they transferred their house. Another important point I want to make is that while the interest rate is variable, um, I think that saying that is confusing because this does not work like a um, variable rate mortgage. I spoke to someone on the finance committee and they said they weren't too concerned that the interest rates were low because as the interest rates rise, you know, the town will be collecting more interest on, this defer on these deferred taxes. Um, that's not really true. The way this program works is that when you defer your taxes over a period of years, it's like getting a fixed rate loan for each year. Once the interest rate is established for a particular year, it sticks with that year. So if you were to borrow currently at 1.75%, you will never pay more than 1.75% on this year's taxes. And I've spoken to Mr. Gilligan about this. He can confirm the methodology for doing the calculation. What that means is that if somebody you know, defers their taxes for 30 years and interest rates go back up again, they are only paying 1.75% on that deferred amount while you know, the town conceivably is borrowing at a much higher interest rate. Um, so the other um, point I think I've already made is that there is an 8% cap. That uh, cap is set by state law. Some people have thought you know, the, the float rate should be able to go higher th than that. It, it cannot. Um, and the other uh, point related to that cap is that the selectmen's vote does not mention that 8% cap. I would read that vote as inconsistent with state law and potentially flawed because it doesn't contain that cap. So in conclusion, I'd like to say I'd like to, I really do appreciate Senator Donnelly bringing this matter forward. When we discussed this in 2006, the reports, I think, of both the selectmen and the finance committee were very clear that we'd revisit this in a year or two. Obviously, you know, that didn't happen, and, and frankly, I'm not sure if Senator Donnelly hadn't taken the initiative that we'd even be here tonight discussing it again. But I think it's prudent for the town not to decrease the interest rate as much as the selectmen are proposing. And I offer my amendment as a middle ground. It will reduce the rates to something that's more consistent with uh, long-term borrowing. Um, it, but it will protect the town's interest, and it will not at all decrease the eligibility of any seniors for this program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Mahan. Hi, Diane Mahan, member of the Board of Selectmen. I just want to say on Warren Article 29 and 30, since they were discussed together at the Selectmen's Warren Article hearing that I was not present at, I want to apologize. I had a, a family situation I had to deal with. Um, so in, in light of that, I want to join with my colleagues, Ms. Rowe, Mr. Dunn, and um, Ms. LaCourte, and also vote in an affirmative on 29 and 30, and applaud everybody who are trying to think about our seniors and those on a fixed income um, as a result of the 2011 override, which we're all very grateful for, possibly providing them some relief. So I'd just like to let town meeting know I'd like to be recorded in the affirmative of the three to zero vote from the Board of Selectmen to make it four to zero on 29 and 30. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tosti. Uh, the Finance Committee voted unanimously to support the uh, recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, I, I think there's a few reasons for that. And I, I think one has been mentioned is that, you know, the last override was about a 10% increase in taxes. And I remember opening my bill and said, whoa, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to think about it in general at a ballot question, so another would actually get the tax bill. Um, of course, it was higher because it was all put on the last two <coughs> bills, because it wasn't on the first two, but still, it, it, was, it was an increase in taxes. Uh, I think the Finance Committee felt um, in, in discussing this at the sessions and, and after the Selectman's action that it was, the Selectman's action is reasonable, uh, that we um, we shouldn't be making a profit. In other words, if we're willing to do this, that um, we shouldn't be 
charging more than it cost the town. And even at 1.75% uh, for, say, the next year, uh, that's still above um, what it's actually costing the town to borrow if we had to borrow revenue anticipation notes. So uh, we're, we're probably still making a small profit, but certainly not near what it would be if it was at 6%. So I, I think the selectmen's uh, motion, it, it, to a certain degree, is a compromise by itself. Uh, you're going to take this money now and invest it. Can you make more than 1.75%? Well, yeah, if you go into Pakistani war bonds or, or you know, something like that. Uh, at a short-term basis, look at the CDs, look at the treasuries, look at the, any investments that you have now, uh, money markets, uh, both bank and, and uh, brokerage money markets. You know, they're paying like 0.5%. Um, so you're not making a profit. The only way you're going to make a profit is if you go out and invest long-term, you know, like a 20-year bond or put it in the stock market. And I, I don't think you're, seeing, you're going to see that happen. Uh, is it frozen for a year? Yes, it's, it's like uh, a, a one-year CD. And, and interest rates usually don't move quite that fast. Uh, they could also go down as well as go up, and so one could think they can't really go down much further than that. Uh, do we anticipate a huge number of people taking this? Uh, you know, probably not. Um, there's a large number of people who simply don't want to do it. It's just, it goes against the values they have or something like that. They just won't do it. How many will take advantage of this? Well, we just don't know. Uh, the experience, I think, in other towns has, has been that there won't be a huge wave, but this can provide some relief for people who might really, really need it. And if it does become a problem a year or two down the line that, you know, the treasurer has to go out and borrow revenue anticipation notes and, and it's costing the town a lot of money, uh, this is a one-year thing. Should, we could come back at a future town meeting and change it back to 6% or 4% or whatever we want. But I think it's worthwhile to give this a try for a year to bring some relief to people who really need it. Um, and, and especially, again, after, to use my baseball, again, uh, they stepped to the plate and helped us last June. And maybe it's our turn to step to the plate and, and help some people who need it. So the Finance Committee, uh, again, unanimously supports the recommendation of the Board of Selectmen. Thank you. Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Monterey. Gordon Jameson, uh, Precinct 12. Um, I tried to listen very carefully to the previous speakers and the presentation by the, um, the board and Mr. Dory and um, our senator, um, but I have a large number of questions. I anticipate that some of you may have the same questions. Um, I get confused when people talk about assets versus income. Obviously, if I live in a house, I have a lot of assets. Is this, this, this particular one is income-based, is that correct? That's my understanding. Okay. Um, Mr. Daughtery mentioned that you could take your water and sewer bill and also defer that. Is that just the debt shift portion or the whole part of the bill? Who knows the answer to that? Mr. Gilligan looks like he Do knows. Ms. Rice, can, he, can you put your water and sewer on this as well or just the taxes? No. The question is, is it the debt shift portion that's in your tax bill that you can defer or the whole water and sewer bill? including the metered rate. Stephen, Mr. Gilligan, do you, can you answer that question for us, Mr. Gilligan? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. Only the Board of Selectmen can waive a current water bill or the town manager. However, anyone who does not pay a water bill within a calendar year the water and sewer bill is leaned onto real estate, and that would then become deferred. Okay, so don't go away, Mr. Gillen. You may have a follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my suggestion on the, on the rate so we can monitor this is that perhaps Mr. Gilligan can report the, uh, this in his report every year to what the current rate would be for someone going forward. I'd be happy to do that. Um, uh, I see little... Um, Mr. Gilligan provided us with a very informative report. Um, I was very pleased to see the end of year cast positions were presented. 
Uh, we, we have no risk, uh, from, in my interpretation, in the, given the few people that will take advantage of this in, in going into a negative cash balance. Therefore, we won't have to borrow anything. But with our wonderful AAA rate, what is our current bond rate, long-term bond rate and short-term borrowing? Uh, our current short-term, well, the recent borrowing you did of a bond anticipation note, uh, given the, the, the structure of the borrowing, which included a premium, our net interest cost was 0.179% okay. for a one-year note. Okay. I think, uh, oh, actually, um, I, I'm, I'm confused um, by the statement, the different statements that have been presented by Mr. Loretti and Senator Donnelly. Senator Donnelly uh, mentioned that when the person uh, transferred the home or be, uh, passed on, that the interest rate would kick in. Uh, is my interpretation that while this would be a year-by-year -year interest rate for that block of interest, so let's say I had $5,000 that I deferred for this current year at or this coming year at 1.75, perhaps interests go up a little bit. It's maybe 2% the next year. That would be for the five plus whatever the new growth is. The interest rate is locked per year. In order for a ta uh, property owner to defer taxes, they must apply on an annual basis. Okay. So each year's deferment locks in the interest rate for that year. The following year, the interest rate could change. Okay, I got the impression from Mr. Loretti's discussion that perhaps um, we don't, they don't pay any interest until um, uh, the, uh, the, the transfer of the property That's happens. correct. No, but, but, nothing but is the, paid until the end of, until the ownership changes in but, some But I want to be clear, form. the interest does accrue. The interest does accrue okay, each so that, and every year. That's, that's very important, that it's not like you wait until then and then you pay a month's interest. It's like the interest is accruing on each of these blocks for every year until the, the uh, transfer event happens. That's correct. Um, I would also interpret um, the risk here to the town as far as being paid as, as zero. This would be AAA risk, basically, uh, the, the loan the town is extending to the property owner because anything happens to the property, uh, we're going to get our money and the interest it's due. Um, as we all know, we, we are fortunate to live in a very stable uh, property uh, environment in Arlington compared to the rest of the world. Um, I think that does it. I, uh, my confusions have been cleared up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gilligan. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Moderator. Um, I will definitely be voting in, in favor of this and uh, ask you to join me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. McKinney. Uh, Lawrence McKinney, Precinct 7. Um, I am wholly in favor of this. And I had one question, which I might ask someone who could answer it. I have got to tell you that I'm older than I look. <laughs> I shot past 65 two years ago. I get my rotator cuffs repaired for 200 bucks a piece of Medicare. And two years ago, I discovered I was eligible for a thing called the circuit breaker. And they dropped another $900 on my head. Um, Will I still be eligible for the circuit breaker if I'm taking advantage of this wonderful thing? You're making less than 51000 Oh, yes. Okay, Ms. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. The Senior Circuit Breaker is a state program that relates to income tax. This is a local program that relates to property tax, so there, there would be no effect of one upon the other. Gracious. Because although it's true that... Is the question still open, Mr. McKinney? Well, if you want, I mean, no, I, that, I was going to continue that um, I like this very much because. I think Mr. Donnelly is anxious to give you a further answer. Oh, oh Senator. What you pay on your property tax so that you would only have to, if you partially defer it, you could still take the circuit breaker, but if you took the full amount in deferral, I believe that you would not have the circuit breaker available to you. Oh, well, that's kind of relief. Yeah. That's why I wanted to check. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to give but, you. But council was correct. It's a state. The circuit break was a state program. This is a town program, but it also was based on what you pay in your property tax. Well, I'm perfectly happy. That means I give the state back 900, but they give me 8,000. I, I can go with that one. All I can think is that I can remember when I paid uh, a, a public, very famous public relations person, $300 an hour when he was 95 years old. 
Uh, Kirk Kerkorian is about to buy another studio. He's 94 years old. I'm only 67. Um, and although I was an entrepreneur, I didn't have a lot of social security. And so I can tell you that this is a substantial increase. And I look forward to it tremendously because, I mean, this means a couple of teeth for me. So I'm very happy for this. I won't bite anybody, I assure you. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming up with this. And I uh, hope you all vote for it unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McCory. Uh, Hugh McCrory, Precinct 20. Um, for all, I guess first of all I want to thank Ken Don Senator Donnelly and, uh, and the people who uh, proposed uh, Article 30. I think uh, Article 30 actually is, uh, is something which helps seniors. Um, I guess I disagree with uh, Mr. Tosti saying that future time meetings we could raise the rate. Uh, I honestly don't believe that will happen. I hope it doesn't happen. Um, so I, th I think I take that with a pinch of salt. Um, talking about property taxes, um, one way to, uh, to increase our property taxes is to decrease our revenue. This article, uh, while the intent is good and I, I wholeheartedly supported Article 30, I'm not so convinced on, on Article 29. The reason why is because it makes, uh, makes no difference to whether people stay in their home or not, it's not, it's, uh, it's not helping people. It, it helps after the property is um, transferred, but I, I don't see how that directly impacts uh, our, our uh, fellow residents, our fellow citizens' lives. I don't think we should be, I don't think it makes sense to give a financial incentive not to pay taxes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I don't think this article uh, helps people stay in their homes. This article uh, defers uh, revenue to the town after the property is transferred or sold. Article 30 does, and I support that, and I think a lot of people did. That's why it passed so unanimously. Um, article 29, I think I'm surprised at the lack of data that we've presented with for, by the proponents of this article, uh, whether or not that's uh, Senator Donnelly, uh, Board of Selectmen, uh, I think it's unrealistic for us to make a decision based on any kind of data. I mean, how widely is this currently used? How much does it cost? Um, can I ask that question through the moderator to the board of selectmen? What data was used to, to evaluate the decision? Mm -hmm. Mr. Dunn, do you have an answer to that question? I guess, Mr. McCoy, my first, I will say that you, you said something earlier that the, that the deferment is only on uh, after the transfer? My understanding is this article is that the, 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 ta the money is, the, the revenue is owed once the property is transferred or, or, or sold. Right, it is deferred, no money is paid by the property owner until they, they pass, at which point then the money is collected after they passed. Correct. Okay, So how, right. how does that? So, the answer, so in answer to your specific question, uh, uh, there are about 10 people who use this deferment to, uh, this year. I do not have the exact cost. So any indication of uh, how much this will cost us? It sounds possibly not like a, a lot of money. Uh, given that the, so with the current interest rate of 6% yeah. and the current uh, uh, income that is being applied, the, like the income limit that is being applied. We have 10 people who apply. Yep. So we have, on Monday, increased the limit of the, uh, increased the number of people who are eligible. Yep. And tonight we would be lowering the interest rate. So we expect that it will increase a certain number. I do not know of any modeling that would tell me exactly how many it is. I expect it's going to be um, a relatively low amount. And also yep. just want to be, to be a little bit more clear. We're no, we don't actually, it won't actually cost us money, as in it, def it costs we, because we collect the money eventually in the end. It just sure. it defers the money coming in. Um, I do not have a valid estimate of how many new people will take, it, uh, uh, take us up on it. Mr. Donnelly, did you have an estimate of the number of yeah, people you believe? What I would say is the town of Lexington went to one quarter of one percent. Point, I think it's point zero twenty six. And when they saw, when that happened, they, they increased to $60,000, and they actually went from like 
I think the numbers were, I had the exact numbers, I don't have them with me. I think they went from 12 to 24 people. This would look, so we're estimating in Arlington if there are 10, then it's probably projected that at least uh, you would see a total of 20. Um, or that's what we've seen in other places when it dropped down. In Lexington, again, that was one quarter of 1%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, M my concern is that it's quite a substantial uh, decrease in percentage-wise and doesn't have any uh, immediate effect. I think the money would be better spent uh, making, uh, reducing people's pro seniors' property taxes on basis on whether or not they can afford to pay. I have one final question, moderator, uh, through, the, through yourself. What exactly is um, what exactly is a senior who is not head of household? So I'm not quite uh, what it, not quite clear on what it means by who are not head heads of household. Maybe the board selectman can answer that question. Ms. Rice is going to tell us. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Juliana Rice, Town Council. Um, it's not a um, calculus that would have to be done here as to whether. Yeah. A senior is or is not a head of household. It's merely borrowing a particular number that is set by the Commissioner of Revenue for the Senior Circuit Breaker Program every year. So the Commissioner of Revenue sets a cer certain different types of um, income limits for that program. And what this statute does, which is a separate statute, is it borrows that number. Uh, maybe I should be sorry, I'll, I'll clarify my question. What exactly is. Um a senior who is not a head of a single senior who is not a head of household. Um, in that case, who is the head of household? I don't know, um, but but it's it's not anything that would have to be determined at the local level. It's not anything going to the eligibility of the seniors at the local level. It's purely the number that's being assigned to their income by the Commissioner of Revenue. Okay, I thought it was actually a, a criteria for whether or not they qualify. No. Okay. That's on number thirty. That's been voted. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman? Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. Motion to terminate debate on all items under this article. <laughs> okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on all items under the article. All in favor of terminating debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. My opinion, it is a two-third vote. All right, we have before us um, the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen is printed in the report. And, huh? Yeah, I was about to get there. I was going to say, then we have Mr. Am Mr. Loretti's amendment that changes that to give us a 4% floor and tacking the interest rate to the 10-year U.S. bond rate as opposed to the one in the Selectmen's report. First, we'll vote on Mr. Loretti's amendment. All in favor of the amendment, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. My opinion, that is defeated. We now have before us the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as printed. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. My opinion, that is a positive vote. That terminates Article 29. That brings us to Article 31. We have a recommended vote of the Board of Selection with no action. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Okay, no action. Article 32. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chapdelaine to speak to this article, please. Okay, we have the recommended vote of the Board of Selection on this. Mr. Chapdelaine? Mr. Dunn, you jump in the gun. Well, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager, uh, while the uh, presentation is being put up on the screen, uh, what I'm going to do here is present the findings and recommendations contained within the Department of Revenue, Division of Local Services, Town and School Finance Analysis. The full version was placed on town meeting member seats last week and the electronic version of the document had been sent to town meeting members in either late January or early February. Uh, for those who need an extra copy, there are uh, about 30 copies on the back table this evening in the hall. Uh, as I go through the report, I want to be clear that I'm not presenting either my opinions or the opinions of any board or committee. Rather, I am presenting on the details that are found within the report. 
however, at the close, I will, uh, at the close of the presentation, I'm going to make my recommended actions for, uh, for a process to move forward. Uh, so through this presentation, how, how am I down below six minutes? You told me last night you only needed seven minutes, dude. You serious? You want ten? I said last night, and he says, give me seven minutes. I thought you were serious. Wow. I only need seven minutes, he said. I didn't know I was going to be held to that. <laughs> Can you, you do it in ten? Yes, absolutely. Quick. Absolutely. You just, you just bought me a minute there. Um, so I'm going to go through some quick history uh, of how we got to the report, the findings that are contained within the report, uh, the recommendations contained within the report by the DOR, and then again, my, my recommendations for a proposed process going forward. So the history, um, at least uh, most recently, began with a vote on Article 51 at last year's town meeting, and that was an affirmative vote to request the town manager uh, res research a consolidated town school finance department. That vote of town meeting uh, was followed by a vote of the Board of Selectmen as well as a vote of the school committee, uh, which resulted in the manager reaching out to the Department of Revenue Division of Local Services to conduct this financial management review. So what sources and methods did the Department of Revenue use? Uh, so staff from the Department of Revenue's Division of Local Services Technical Assistance Bureau as well as the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education School Business Services Unit interviewed both in person and via the telephone uh, appointed, uh, excuse me, appointed committee members, elected board members, as well as town and school finance staff. The full list of all uh, board members, committee members, and staff members that were interviewed uh, are contained in the last page of the Department of Revenue's report. Uh, what did they look at? They looked at annual budget documents. They looked at our tax recap sheet. They looked at balance sheets and audits prepared by our external auditors. They looked at the Powers and Sullivan report that was a result of the FY10 school deficit. They looked at the Massachusetts Association for School Business Officials report, which also was performed in the aftermath of the FY10 school deficit. They looked at Town Manager Act and the town bylaws in regards to how they put together the town's current financial structure. And they really focused on three things. Where are we now in regards to our structure? what potential efficiencies or improvements could we make uh, within our existing structure, and then what benefits or efficiencies could we realize through uh, a re-altering or, uh, or an altering or restructuring of the way we do it now. So starting with their findings, um, their initial finding was that despite uh, the town's structural deficit uh, for the past several years, it has earned a AAA bond rating from S&P. Uh, however, they did comment that despite that rating, S&P does rate the town's financial management as good rather than strong, uh, which is an indicator that financial practices do exist in most areas, uh, but might not be formalized or uh, regularly monitored. Uh, they were also impressed and engaged with the experienced uh, Capital Planning Committee, the Finance Committee, and the multi-year reports and the annual budgets produced, as well as the capital reports that are produced for a town meeting to vote on every year. Some of their general findings uh, revolve around uh, the issues that they see with independent finance officers as well as the lack of accountability that that independence creates. Uh, and they talk about the issues that come from independent finance officers when you're dealing with a finance structure that has multi-departmental uh, departmental responsibilities and how the lack of coordinated centralized management can create difficulties in creating that multi-departmental uh, departmental cooperation. They talk about historically how the town manager and the department, um, excuse me, the deputy town manager play a coordinating role amongst town finance departments, uh, but the cooperation is voluntary and there's no actual accountability that's held through that process. Uh, they mention, and I, I don't have on the slide, but they mention that uh, Arlington has not followed the trend of many Massachusetts communities, uh, particularly among comparably sized communities with a AAA bond rating, to create a consolidated finance department with financial positions accountable to an administrator or a finance director. So they pose a question in the report. If Arlington wants to raise its financial management to the strong level, the question the town must address is, who is in charge of financial management in general? And in particular, who is responsible for ensuring that consistent, effective control and monitoring practices are in place across departments? The short answer now is that there is no one officer or board vested with the formal authority to fulfill this responsibility. Some of the direct findings they had were in regards to uh, the FY10 school deficit uh, and the issues that caused that or, or what they found the issues to be that caused that. 
an investment loss realized in FY 2009 through the Treasury and Collector's Office, as well as an error on the FY 11 tax rate or tax recap sheet that resulted from a data entry error based on uh, the enterprise fund uh, rink offset uh, from, from the, um, the rink enterprise fund. And, I, and the, the school department's FY10 uh, $1.5 million deficit was also addressed um, uh, several times within the report. Moving forward, um, they looked at departmental uh, budget processes and the preparation of annual budgets and the use of the MUNIS budget module. Uh, they had concerns with um, the lack of using the budget module as a centralized database for the budget process and recommended using it as a, a, a MUNIS's capabilities to go from start to finish in the preparation of a budget and also using MUNIS for both monthly and quarterly um, budget monitoring. Uh, they also addressed the situation between the Treasurer's Office, the Treasurer Collector's Office, and the Comptroller's Office, uh, where both offices were keying in the same information uh, because of the lack of integrated software existing between the two departments. And I think the final uh, slide on findings talks about um, the town's process of using enterprise fund offsets as part of the um, as part of the operating budget, uh, they had concerns with the use of these offsets and the impacts they have on transparency with the town's budget. Uh, they also talked about the tax recap or the tax rate setting process. That's an annual process uh, that occurs in late November and December in terms of setting the town's tax rate based on the appropriations that are made by a town meeting. And historically, that process has been handled by the elected assessors and the comptroller without a role for the town manager, and they had concerns that the town manager who in working with the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee puts together the financial plan that there was no role uh, for the manager in setting the tax rate. I seem to have left the rest of my notes right here. Apologize for that. So with, with those findings, they have a list of recommendations that I don't want to read directly through. Uh, the first several talk about their recommendation to create a consolidated town finance department. Uh, so pursuing a change to the Town Manager Act to accomplish that. Uh, creating an appointed position for the treasurer collector to be appointed by the town manager. To create a director of assessing uh, that is appointed by the town manager. Consider making uh, the Board of Assessors an appointed board. And maintaining the appointed status of the comptroller under the Board of Selectmen for both appointment and removal in order to provide some independence for what they label to be a critical position. Uh, they go into uh, recommending exploring further the MUNIS budget module uh, for uh, departmental uh, budget submissions as well as using it as a centralized database, as I mentioned earlier. They talk about including payroll and the, uh, the payroll and purchasing functions in a consolidated finance department. And they recommend that while the town moves forward on looking at a town side restructuring, that the town manager and the school superintendent work together to address uh, what they identified as outstanding issues with previous town school consolidations and what would be included is, uh, in that is facilities, IT, and the payroll functions. They go on further to recommend the school department purchase and implement an automated system for recording school staff absences and hiring of substitutes. They recommend improving uh, administrative capacity at the building or cost center level uh, in the school department. Uh, they recommend that uh, any, any problems they've addressed with the facilities, IT, and payroll consolidations be addressed before moving farther with any um, larger uh, consolidation between the town and school finance operations. Uh, should there be a, a merged town and uh, school finance operation, they recommend the superintendent and the school committee have dedicated um, access, uh, excuse me, access to a dedicated staff member who has licensure as a school business official. They recommend that once the merged finance department is running smoothly, that it conduct a complete review of the town's budget format, as well as its chart of accounts and financial reporting. They also recommend the town and school work together to develop a written agreement concerning the allocation of municipal costs eligible to be included as net school spending. And finally, they recommend in regard to the school committee chair uh, process, the school committee chair's process of reviewing and signing the school payroll warrant only after it's been completed and gross salary information by employees available for their review. So um, that is all that was contained in the Department of Revenue uh, report. And again, um, paper copies have been made available, electronic copies are available. If anybody would like another electronic copy, we'd be happy to make that available. Um, the process uh, I'm recommending is beginning tonight with the presentation of this report, uh, moving into the summer, June, July, and August, holding a series of stakeholder meetings biweekly over the course of those three months, 
with all of the uh, stakeholders of these departments that would be impacted by any financial restructuring um, to address all of the concerns. And I do mention that any, anything that would be procedural and not structural, we would try to address immediately to make the improvement. Going forward, coming out of those meetings, um, I propose a series of public meetings to be held in uh, which a menu of options would be presented to the public based on the work of that stakeholder group uh, and to have feedback be solicited from the public in regards to those, um, in regards to those menu of options. Uh, in November, have those options reduced to single recommended solutions based on the feedback and continued work of the stakeholder group. Uh, then moving forward to next year uh, in preparation for town meeting, filing any necessary warrant articles uh, and then potentially in a uh, town meeting next year taking any necessary action. And that's my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Hold on. Um, do we get a second on receiving the report? Second. All in favor re of receiving the report say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Okay. It's not, we, the report is received. Now, about 10 people have raised their hand, but there really is nothing to debate here. There's nothing before us. Wait, Mr. Dari, let me finish. There's nothing for us to debate for those folks. All we're doing is receiving the report. Next year, they're going to come back and tell us the wonderful things they want to do. So I really don't want to get into a debate about the merits of the report. Yes, Mr. Doherty, what's your point of order? No, okay. I'll, it's not a no action article, receiving a report. Just like the school committee is going to get up next week and present their report to us, the capital planning committee presents their reports to us, the selectmen presents the reports. Mr. Gilligan gave a two minute presentation of his report. The reports are presented to us and receive them. Some folks just say, here's my report, and then we receive them. I gave them the benefit of giving the time to present the report because we asked them to come back and report to us. So we really have nothing to debate. So. I don't really want to continue to talk about it. Yes, sir. Hold on. Yeah, we are kind of getting a debate here, Jim. I know, but yeah, you have to come to the front and introduce yourself. But again, that's kind of fostering the debate. Yeah, I see Stephen. to Chairman of the Board of Assessors. I just think that for someone to present a report such as Mr. Gilligan, such as I did the first night, such as many other people chose to do, they can present a report at any given time. However, this one was given under the auspices of two articles that were voted no action. And I just think from a clarity standpoint, so it's a level playing field for everyone, it should be done at a given time and not in pot with two articles so that we've heard from one side. The, well, only, thing, the only thing I would recommend is that everyone should read the report and should read the report and in, in, in thoroughly be prepared because there's no support for any of their conclusions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I urge everyone in the meeting and town to read the report because it puts the drastic changes on our form of government. But this is not a no action article. It's a vote cleverly put in to re receive the report. So I think that terminates debate on this. What's your point of order, Mr. Gilligan? Mr. Moderator, Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. I don't wish to debate the findings as listed in the DOR report. But there is a gross misrepresentation, if not an outright lie, that was in the DOR report, and it was also repeated in the manager's presentation that I would like to correct. Okay. May I do so? Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Moderator, it casts aspersions on my professional uh, performance as well as the performance of my office. And I think it's a gross misrepresentation. All right. Did that... Ten seconds, Mr. Ten Martin. seconds, then that's it. Then we're moving on to the next article. Thank you, Mr. Martin. No more questions or it points It says of here in the presentation of the town manager, and I don't fault Mr. Chapter Lane for putting this in. He's repeating it. But it is a gross misrepresentation, and I don't want town meeting to take it as gospel. 
The comment is made that the Treasurer Collector's Office invested proceeds from property tax overrides that were set aside in a special purpose stabilization fund in risky investments at State Street Bank. During FY 2009, these investments experienced a net loss of about $500,000 in principal, and the Attorney General's Office recovered about $230,000 from State Street Bank, failing to fully disclose the risky nature of these investments. First and foremost, the investments were not risky. They were in a passive bond fund that State Street Bank purposefully moved without authorization. I uncovered that. I went to the Attorney General's Office, not only covered the full million dollars pristine and pure funds, but additional money due to the town's efforts. The Attorney General took that information to go after State Street for, an, for additional agencies of, of municipalities and states and recovered $333 million because of the, the effort that I initiated, and that can be borne out by town council. Thank you very much, Mr. Mullen. Thank you, and thank you for your efforts. Okay, that ends 32. 33, we have a recommended vote of no action. All in favor? Opposed? No action. Article 34, Home Rule Legislation Wireless Antennas. Uh, Sleckman's big report. Mr. Moderator, I think the, thank you, the comment and the text of the article are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, this is something that we tried to do last year and because uh, the original uh, vehicle for this uh, sunsetted we tried to do a, to create this vehicle last year. The legislature asked us to do it slightly differently. We're back to, uh, to bring it back. So thank you. Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. And one of the proud six who voted against this last year and who will vote against it again this year. And I hope I, uh, we get more than six people to vote against it this year. This article is completely unnecessary. Uh, in past years, prior to last year, there were certain um, uh, things in state law that required home rule legislation in order to affect the desired oh, results. Fuck. The state legislature changed that. We didn't need to pass this last year. This article in no way affects the amount of rents we will, see for, for, we will receive for wireless uh, leases. They will be exactly the same whether this article passes or not. The only thing it does is it sets up a separate account. And what we're doing is we're saying to our state legislators, you've got to go and spend the effort to create this special account on our behalf because we're not adult enough to track funds ourselves. You know, I think our um, finance committee, I think our capital planning committee does a great job in allocating funds for specific purposes. And they are entirely capable of doing that for the wireless lease proceeds. So I'm going to vote against this because others say it's, it isn't necessary. Um, and I think, you know, we ask enough of our state legislators. They spend way too much time on this type of local legislation. And it, it is simply a waste of effort. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to this article? Mr. McCory, I'm sorry, Hugh. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, this article uh, crossed my... I had a similar uh, question in my mind last year when this article came before us, and it's, I see it's come up again. Uh, we're trying to uh, streamline our finance, finance department, but yet we're, uh, the, the money for this, uh, these antennas doesn't go into the general fund, it goes into a special fund for parks and maintenance. I mean, is this real? Why, why, why aren't we, why doesn't this revenue go into the general fund? And uh, I urge you to uh, not to support this article. Thanks. Did you wish, wish an answer to that question, Ms. McCory? If someone can answer why this, uh, why the revenue does not go into the general fund, I'd be yeah, be very interested to hear mm -hmm. that. Do you have and a I can take it offline. answer to that? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, 
this fund was created, I believe, 10 or 12 years ago based on a vote of town meeting in order to set aside this antenna lease revenue to support uh, capital expenditures on, uh, on parks and, uh, and recreational facilities. Uh, so annually, you may see in the capital budget an offset coming out of this fund appropriated by town meeting to support expenditures to upkeep and to, to, to renovate and reconstruct park, um, parks and recreational facilities. So that, that's, that's why it was created. Um, they're, they're, town, it, town meeting sees it. It's not spent without uh, town meeting uh, you know, looking at its expenditures through the capital plan uh, and the capital appropriation uh, at, at town meeting every year. Um, so I, I don't know if... if um, Joe Conley we would like to speak to some of the projects uh, in the capital budget. I know we'll get to the capital budget yeah, on Monday we'll evening. That. But so, okay, so that's, that's the history of it. Why, why is okay. it still the case, I guess, is really what uh, I'm asking. And it, it, it's, it's still, so a, mechanism, it it's still a mechanism that's there to, to be able to support uh, continued investment in, uh, in our parks. But we already invest in our parks. Uh, I mean, this is, isn't the only fund that we use to invest in our parks, correct? If this wasn't available as an offset to the capital budget, but there would be less money that could be spent in the capital budget and decisions would have to be made to either invest less in parks or other potential uh, town and school facilities. Okay. All right. Thanks. Ms. LaCourte. Annie LaCourte, Precinct 15. Um, I'd like to speak to something that Mr. Loretti said. I have a couple of questions that I think might clarify something that I think is, that I understand differently than he does. Um, it is true that funds that go into the general fund may be used for operating costs. At the end of the year, if we have not spent our full budget, those funds then become free cash, have to be certified by the state and rebudgeted. And my understanding as a selectman was that these kinds of funds that are set aside for a special purpose have to be dealt with differently in order to avoid um, those monies simply rolling into the general fund and being generally appropriated. That yes, we could attract them, we could track them in the accounting system in some way, but it would not be quite the same as what we are trying to accomplish here. And the intention is that the money go from a particular revenue stream to a particular purpose similar to our revolving funds. Could perhaps somebody from the Finance Committee speak to whether or not I'm right about this assumption and whether or not it would be more difficult for us to segregate these funds if we didn't do it in this way and use them for the purpose town meeting intended them for 12 years ago? Mr. Tosti, is her assumption correct? No, what Ms. LaCourt said is, is inherently accurate. Um, you know, we, we have a set percentage of the total amount to be raised uh, that is appropriated each year by this body and the capital budget. And if there wasn't a certain amount of money coming in from this antenna fund for parks, then we wouldn't be able to spend as much money on, uh, on the parks. So, yes, you are accurate. So essentially what town meeting did is they said we're creating a revenue stream based on something that suddenly became possible when cell towers and antennas became a thing that actually existed. And we want to be sure if we're going to give up whatever it is we're giving up to allow the, the use of public lands to put up these towers, so on and so forth, that we dedicate the return we get for that to a specific purpose. And I suspect that this was a specific purpose, the support of park maintenance and capital projects in the parks, that they felt was easily cut when the budget is under pressure and that they wanted to protect it and that that was the point of this. And I think it's a point that was well taken at the time and probably still is. So I'm in support of the article and I urge you to be in support of it as well. Mr. McCabe. Harry McKay, Precinct 21. Uh, the correct answer to the question is because when this program started, the St. Paul's Lutheran Church came to us and said, if you will allow us to put antennas on our church, we will make a contribution to the town for the town's parks and recreation program. That's the answer. These other answers are 
subsequent to that event. From that time on, it's just history. That's why the money is being put aside for parks and recreation. Thank you for that history lesson. Um, Mr. Deist? That was John Dice, Precinct 13, moving the question. All in favor of moving the question, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Okay. Debate is terminated. We have before us a re recommended report of the Board of Selectmen. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it's a positive vote. Yeah, that brings us to Article 35. Yes, sir. Ms. Rice, do we need a two-third vote? Okay, then I can declare a two-third vote because that definitely was. Then I'm going to go back. Um, Madam Clerk, do you certify that more than 85 members of the meeting are here and present and voting in the affirmative? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Carmen. Dean, Car yeah. Dean Carmen, Precinct 20. Mr. Moderator, unless my memory's gone, in prior years when we had home rule legislation, we've been told that we had to do a standing vote to show the legislature how much the meeting supported it. Does that not matter anymore? Um, my understanding from the, when we researched the two-third vote being declared by the moderator, that was acceptable to the legislature. Correct, but I thought in the past we've been told it wasn't a matter of it was a majority or two-thirds but when you send something up for home rule, you wanted to show what the vote was, because if it was overwhelming support, the legislature would be more likely to act. No, it, That's what I thought we'd been told in no. the past. We, we can, if my understanding is they will, they like the two-third declared vote as well, as long as it's certified, which is why we made that rule. Yes, sir. It's too late. We already voted. Yeah, we, we can't understand. You have to come forward, sir. Introduce yourself. Yeah, everybody's got to do that, man. John Marr, Precinct 14. Having appeared before legislative committees on behalf of the town or home rule legislation, I was frequently asked the quantum of the vote. And I, it is my understanding that if we don't have a standing vote on this, it will be the first time on special legislation in recent memory, in my memory at least, that we have not had it. So I respectfully suggest we have a standing vote. Well, that, that's the, this is the first time we've had the ability to declare a two-third vote. Um, Ms. Rice, can you have your opinion as to whether the legislature will send us packing or whether this will be acceptable? I'd prefer just to move on. Wait, Mr. No, sit down. I have a question to counsel. He's next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Um, I will just point out that the rule that was adopted by this meeting last year and put into a bylaw concerning two-thirds votes um, really applied where um, the um, increased quantum was required by some other provision of law, either two-thirds or four-fifths or something else. So in this case, uh, the quantum um, is just a majority, as it is for any piece of home rule legislation. So in order to be safe, and deferring, of course, to the senator, um, it may be best to take the standing vote. Mr. Donnelly, can we hear what your opinion would be? As chairman of state administration regulatory oversight, the only time that we need to know how many, if it's two-thirds, is on an Article 97. Uh, but other than that, uh, we, we do not uh, ask uh, if you have a majority from home rule and it's a home rule petition, that's enough for the legislature, whether I'm presiding over the, uh, the Senate or if I'm uh, in committee, uh, we never ask what the vote is. Okie dokie. <laughs> the horse's mouth. Article 35 is now before us. Recommended vote of no action. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous no action. There we go. Tell the legislature. Article 36, endorsement of CBGB monies. We got a printed report and it's going to tell us all the great things. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, you have on your chairs, and those of you who are on the ta uh, town meeting email list, received earlier, the week, earlier in the week the report of the, uh, the CDBG application. 
as many of you remember and some of you who are newer will not yet know, but you're about to learn, uh, the federal government awards a block grant program that Arlington is eligible for a certain uh, amount of money. Uh, that money is, uh, it, is a quir it is an unusual piece of money for the town of Arlington in that it is actually uh, voted for by the Board of Selectmen. It's not actually controlled by town meeting, which is pretty much the only time that that happens. Uh, we do bring it to town meeting uh, for your endorsement for the purposes of uh, both transparency and, to just, uh, and for your guidance. The little bit about the process on this is that there are a number of applications, uh, there's a call for applications that are put out. The applications are uh, submitted to the, um, to the town hall. Um, they're reviewed by a subcommittee that consists of uh, two selectmen, the town manager, and I believe Carol was on that committee, uh, Kowalski, uh, t the planner is on that committee as well. Uh, I know she's at the meetings, I just can't remember if she's technically a part of the uh, meeting. Uh, we get far more in terms of requests than we have the capability to, uh, than we have the amount of money. Furthermore, uh, the federal government has cut the amount of money that is available to us dramatically. Uh, as you can see in the report, it's down 13%. We do have uh, one of our programs is a loan program where we loan out money to people who need uh, their houses to be improved if they, they meet the, the criteria. And then that money comes back to us when they make repayments and, and interest. We are eligible to use that money that comes back to us, a fraction of it, as uh, a part, like we are allowed to respend a part of that. So it's, like, it's an, essentially another income stream for this program. Uh, so we used that money that comes back to us to essentially level fund the CDBG. So even though the amount that we got from the federal government is down 13%, uh, with some exceptions, uh, we level funded uh, the policy here. Uh, we are here for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harrington? Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, Thank you, Mr. Dunn, and um, for the planning committee for the CDBG report. Um, the program income increase was something new last year. We, we actually found out about it um, when, because we wanted to increase the money for athletic scholarships for low-income students. And so if you'll look in your report, you'll see that the uh, funding for low-income students um, is not level-funded. It's, it's decreased by a a large fraction. Um, the last year we had, I think it was $43,000. Uh, this year it'll be down to $8,000. So um, in fact, it's um, uh, the reason that I bring this up is because there was a revenue stream for low-income students for scholarships that no longer exists. Um, Mr. Moderator, I have a question yes, sir. Uh, to the planning department. Um, how much money was deposited into the athletic fee revolving account for athletic scholarships so far this year? Ms. Kowalski, do you have an answer for that? I don't know how much has been deposited, but uh, the request for the reimbursement for them has not yet been made, and it's just about to be made from the information I have. So the point is, though, that that money will be deposited into the revolving fee account for athletic fees. Is that the case? Carol Kowalski, Director of Planning. Uh, the the uh, scholarships have been made, and they'll be requesting to be reimbursed, is my understanding, from the grants administrator. Okay, so uh, just to clarify, um, the monies that come from CDBG are deposited into the athletic fee revolving account. Now, um, so this year, there'll be $30,000 less or so deposited into that revolving account. Mr. Moderator, could I ask a question of the school department? I see that the finance um, people from the school department are here this evening. Uh, do they intend to deposit the $35,000 difference into the athletic fee revolving account that is no longer being funded through the CDBG funds. What, what $35,000 difference? We're talking about the CBGB money here. Were so um, last year, uh, yeah. it was a $43,000 CDBG grant 
uh, for low income scholarships that were deposited into the athletic fee revolving account. Mr. Chapdelaine is going to enlighten us about what money was deposited where and how. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. My understanding is out of that $43,000 that was requested last year from both the base budget and the program income, that the need this year will be somewhere around twenty-two dollars or $23,000. That will be submitted for reimbursement from the school department to the CDBG or to the planning office. The remainder of those funds are not expected to be needed by athletic scholarships, so they are planning to be redistributed to other programs listed on the public services that are currently funded by CDBG. You, you, we, we can't just transfer the money that has to be a reimbursement or an expense associated with it. Uh, so there, is, there isn't an athletic scholarship need in this current fiscal year up to that amount. So those, uh, those funds will be redirected to other public service programs. I guess I'm, I'm not being clear. The, the money was transferred into the revolving fee account. So it's a revolving account. I, I, I can't say that I know that any money has been transferred from the CDBG fund into an athletic revolving account. So could I ask someone from the school department whether or not they deposit the money into a revolving account? Madam? So these are the kind of questions you're supposed to give us up front so they can have answers for you? I asked at the Board of Selectmen meeting. Diane yeah. Johnson, Chief Financial Officer, okay. Arlington Public Schools. Thank you. Um, present, I'm sorry, um, Diane Johnson, Chief Financial Officer, Arlington Public Schools. Presently, we have not yet put in the request to CDGB, so no funds have been transferred to the school department at this time. We request reimbursement for those student athletes who meet the eligibility requirements of CDGB and um, whose athletic fees we have already waived because of their income status. CDGB serves to reimburse the school department partially for these fees we basically forgive otherwise. We have not yet done this transaction. It customarily takes place in the spring after all of the um, spring sports have been settled down. So as a follow-up question, um, are you comfortable with the um, cut in the uh, CDBG funding? Um, prior to FY12, $8,000 was the amount allocated each year. And so, yes, I am. So there will be, the difference will be deposited into the revolving fee account. The reason it matters is because um, that's how um, people pay, you know, user fees cover a large fraction of the sports costs. And so uh, just like with the antennas, the revenue stream to support recreation, um, uh, rehabilitation and maintenance, um, the monies from the CDBG on prior years goes into a revolving fee account that's dedicated for uh, athletic fees. And so by taking it out of the CDBG funding now, that money will no longer uh, be available. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chappett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roland Chappett, Precinct 12. A two-part question. At the end of the year, if there's any money left over in a particular part of the CDBG that was not spent, what happens to that money? The other half of the question is, it was a very large project, and only a portion of the funds for that particular project are allocated in a particular year. Will it go into a a kitty, if you will, until enough money is available to complete that project. Yep, go ahead. I got you, Paul. Yep. Uh, you thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mics. Thank you, town meeting members. Uh, if money is left over in uh, an allocated area, they like uh, housing and urban development, likes us to reprogram it. If I can justify that there's a project for which we have to accumulate funds, and I justify it well, they will let us do that. It's very challenging to do that. We've been um, asked not to do that. They would much rather have us reprogram it to another category where the need is, um, where the demand is there. I hope that answers the question. Satisfactory, Mr. Chappett? Okay, it's 9.30, 10 minute break. Um, let's start right back at, um in 10 minutes, please. 
lacrosse kids are outside. Actually, the lacrosse kids' moms are outside. Um, go buy stuff from them. Ch and Precinct 18 has yet to organize. Please go to your designated organization spot. All precincts should have been organized by now. Thank you. Precinct 19, back left corner.
Ready, Sarah? Let's come to order. Let's come to order, please. Take your seats, sit down. All right, we're, we're just... <clears throat> Hello. We have a flare gun here. Please come to order. Okay, we're discussing CBGB money. And re again, remember, we can't really change what they're recommending to us. We can only question and then endorse or turn it down in full. So the next speaker is Ms. LaCourt. There is an, ah, oh, there we go. So, Annie LaCourte, Precinct 15. I'm probably being a little um, uptight here, but I just want to clarify for everybody, um, because it felt a little muddy to me, that the CDBG program, when those funds get expended, it is on a reimbursement basis. You have to show that you spent the money for the purpose for what it was allocated, and then the, the, a, a check is written to reimburse you for that. So there's no sense in which, when we make an allocation for a particular purpose, that it's deposited in the account of that organization, and that's it. They actually have to do a pretty extensive reporting back, and they have to provide invoices, and so on and so forth, so that we have proof for um, the people who are giving us the money, the HUD department, that we, the money actually got spent as intended, and that's really the answer to the question on the athletic scholarships is that we are waiting for the reimbursement request to be filed so that we can give them the money. And I hope you will all forgive me. I really will get over this thinking I'm still a selectman by the end of the town meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Dunn. Pass. Mr. Loretti. 36. CBGB money. We endorse Thank it you, or Mr. not? Thank you, Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Um, just a couple of questions. On the f uh, I have a question on the very first item that's on, in the table on the back page of this um, handout. And what it says is affordable housing programs funded at $228,000 and change. What, what does that mean? Ms. Kowalski? <clears throat> Part of the affordable housing program includes uh, our ability to uh, work on housing programs. It also helps to offset the, partially offset the salary of the director of housing, uh, the housing director, senior planner in the department. But is, I guess what I'm wondering is, is this um, funding for town entities or is some of it going to nonprofit housing programs? Some of it goes to both. Some of it goes to a town staff position, a partial, partial position, and some of it goes to uh, foster uh, affordable housing programs. Uh, the, some of it will go to the Housing Corporation of Arlington, okay. who Thank put in a request. So, part the, so their request is part of that? Um, Top line item, is that Item correct? one, that's right. Okay. Um, I guess I would ask Mr. Moderator if it's possible. I, I have, um, it's a bit of a source of annoyance to me sometimes in town about the way that nonprofit organizations are confused with town entities. And I th would ask, you know, whenever we're funding items that include nonprofit entities, that they are, you know, clearly identified as such and not mixed in uh, or described or, or grouped with. Um, funding that may indeed be going to true town entities. Um, just one other question, and this is under planning. The first item under planning is comprehensive master planning, um, funded at $52,000. I th thought I saw somewhere, and I, I can't find it now, it might have been in the Finance Committee report, 
a line item for $75,000 for a master plan. And I'm wondering if this uh, $52,000 is part of that $75,000 or is it additional? Ms. Kowalski? That's in addition okay. to this allocation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Judd? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Lyman Judd, Precinct 9. I have uh, two questions, at least, on the article as it is voted in the uh, Selectman's Report. The first two items are private way repair, public way repair, which seems to show that nothing happened, whether it's receipts or expenditures, that their balances... Mr. Judge, can you speak right into the mic? I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, sorry, sorry. I say that under this article, the first two items oh. that are in the... The wrong article, Lyman. We're talking about 36 CBGBs. Well, well this, is, this is the CDBG revolving fund. Okay, if you want to stick with 36, I would suggest the following. We have to balance our budget. The state has to balance its wait, budget. Wait, wait, Lyman. But we may not get any more CDBG funding because the federal government doesn't seem to be able to balance its budget. And I think that there is likely, depending on the uh, electoral outcome in November, to be a severe cutback in federal funding. So I hope that the various agencies and projects that we are looking for are either quietly put away or at least some other provision made for them. This is uh, this CDBG funding going back to when it started. As I remember it, it was originally for communities in excess of 50,000 population. Do you have questions about this year's funding as opposed to funding during the Nixon administration? <laughs> yes, sir. What is that question, sir? It's Let's not a question. It's a simple statement. E this Sorry, year, I used the word question. Statement. The following. That... Since uh, our population has fallen below 50,000, we have been very fortunate that through our government uh, representatives, senators, etc., we have been able to be grandfathered in on the CDBG funding. And again, that grandfather clause could be kicked out the window by the next Congress. So we just have to at least consider what's to be done, and that's why I was saying in the next part of, in the Article 37, I would suggest people just look at the balances and the uh, beginning balance and ending balance to see where we're going. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fuller? Yeah. Mr. McCabe? Okay, motion. Okay. Again. Microphones. Um, Mr. McCabe, Precinct 6 has moved, Precinct 2 has moved to terminate debate on all articles in this issue. All issues under this article, all in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? No. Debate is terminated. We have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen with their recommendations for CDBG money. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. My opinion is a positive vote. We have now before us Article 37, Revolving Funds. Mr. Dunn. Uh, Article 37 you have before you, it has the various funds, the amounts that were spent, um, and also note at the bottom, at the, uh, on page 16, we're creating a new one. Thank you. Mr. Jameson. Mr. Judd, next. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, Long-standing members of the, uh, on the uh, meeting will realize that this is something I've uh, taken an interest in the last couple of years, um, including the addition of the new revolving fund that Mr. Uh, Dunn mentioned. Um, the, the, net, the net potential expenditures now totals in excess of $2 million. 
Um, it is, I, I believe these are under the uh, auspices of the town manager and uh, through him, the board of selectmen. Uh, I'm quite pleased that we now have at least three members that are very interested in the revolving funds. Um, Ms. Mahan has spoken uh, eloquently on those in the past. Uh, Mr. Dunn has a, a significant experience in the finance committee and looking at outside funds, funds beyond the general fund. And Mr. Curro also has uh, obviously experience through his years in the school committee. Um, in, this, in that this is a year where we've obviously done a lot of work, uh, the people behind me have done a lot of work reviewing our bylaws and making changes where needed. I would hope that uh, the board and the manager and the town council and the department heads would review how these funds are being used. And so the initial intent, um, as reported to the meeting when they were adopted, um, all jibes with the current practice being involved with the use of the funds. Um, I, note, I note that in another, um, in the report of the Finance Committee relating to a different uh, potential fund uh, um, creation event, that the Finance Committee uh, reported in that, under that article that they are in generally against the, the formation of funds that lie outside of the general fund. Um, perhaps the, the chair of the Finance Committee could uh, comment on these funds in particular. Mr. Twast, do you know of what he speaks? Uh, the Finance Committee is becoming more concerned uh, with the creation of a lot of these different funds that don't flow through the general fund and uh, even had a great deal of debate on the uh, antenna fund. Uh, in the special town meeting, there, there is a uh, uh, motion to create a new fund for energy conservation and a large number of the finance committee wants that funds to flow through the general fund like of others so priorities can be set. Uh, all of these revolving funds were created by town meeting. Uh, they're under the authority of the uh, selectmen. Not quite sure why, but that's the way the law was set. Uh, but yes, we do have some concern about uh, a lot of the different funds that flow outside of the general fund. Uh, thank you, Mr. Toski. And, and on that line, um, uh, I'm, I'm quite interested to understand um, uh, some more details about this new fund with expenditures up to $450,000. Um, so this is the central school building, I believe the building behind us that houses um, the Board of Health and, and such. Um, uh, anticipated receipts, uh, perhaps the manager could uh, comment on that and the util use of the funds. Mrs. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, that fund is proposed to be established this year based on the expiration of the urban renewal plan uh, that it has been in place for the Central School and also 27 Maple Street, which is part of the Central School property. And you are correct, it is the property directly located behind Town Hall. Uh, that fund would be established to accept the rents and any uh, lease proceeds from the tenants of those buildings and then go to pay both staff costs associated with um, uh, custodial work in the buildings as well as uh, utility costs and all other maintenance and uh, maintenance and repair costs associated with the buildings. So in, in, in these cases, beyond the custodial fees for like uh, in other funds like that, there's the Whittemore House and the Town Hall Fund are all very similar to, in that mm -hmm. regard. But um, I am concerned that, that since we're in many of these funds, there is some limited or in here specifically stated capital expenditures that, that we're doing this offset thing that you just told us the, the DOR was not terribly pleased with this off, offset approach to life. Um, and that we're basically expanding our capital plan beyond the 5% out of the general fund through these mechanisms. Well, Is that one interpretation? Yeah, I, I guess I, I'm not sure where, where you get to capital expenditures. Well, it says capital improvements, a revolving fund, blah, 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 capital improvements and other costs. I suppose... Uh, I guess that would be one in, in, interpretation that we would be circumventing the capital planning process. But right now, any improvements to the central school as well as 27 Maple do go through the capital planning okay. process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Okay. Um, so that's, that's a rather large and new one. Um, and um, the two million that I mentioned up front, uh, that number has grown substantially since uh, my time on, on the committee uh, as much as three to four fold. 
Um, the other really large one is the um, life support services, also known as the rescue uh, fund. This comes from proceeds from uh, uh, transport uh, and association with uh, Ar Armstrong Ambulance, as I, I believe. Um, each of these report, each of these segments for each one of these funds is basically a mini balance sheet for that fund. So if, if I if I report the balance sheet for my company, I have the beginning of the year, I have the receipts, I have the expenditures, and I have the end of the year cash position. That's what you have here. Um, for some of these larger funds, and I can track in the rescue fund, if uh, if you will about 175,000 of that because that appears as offsets against the cost of the uh, rescue equipment in the capital plan and towards two EMTs that are being paid out of this, um, which I'm very supportive of both of those actions, the offset issue notwithstanding, but that would leave $600,000. And my request in the future would be that, that these, that maybe not in this actual vote, but in uh, ancillary information provided to the meeting, that in some of these larger, um, things above $50,000 in expenditures, that there might be some granularity on the types of expenditures um, that reported rather than just a line item expenditures to the meeting so we would have a better understanding of um, what we're voting to say, yes, that's great. And with that, um, I will recommend uh, passage of the, um, with these caveats that we're making more and more of these funds and we need to uh, think about that carefully in the future, I will uh, vote, be voting in favor of this, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Judd? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. We are talking now about Article 37. Yes, we are, sir. Good. I've plowed up with it. The only, these are comments, as I said before, the first two items, private way repair, public way repair, have shown no receipts or expenditures. Now, I do not know if this is being covered elsewhere by our expenditures, but <clears throat> I will have to say that some of the streets in this town are in need of uh, repair, to say the least. So I don't know if we have any uh, explanation for that. <clears throat> the only other thing I note, too, amongst these is if you look on page 15, second item from the bottom, town hall rental, that's the place we're in right now, and apparently it's quite profitable. Started with $8,510.50, balanced at the end, $29,904.19. So and I think it behooves us to make sure that this building stays in good condition. And the last item, the re uh, addendum, a revolving fund for the central school rental to accept proceeds, shortening, et cetera, which is basically the senior center, the Council on Aging, the Board of Health. There is also an adult daycare center there. Now, th that building is over 100 years old. And of course, we've had to alter the interior of the building for several reasons to accommodate the new uses. But I would dare say that it, as a general building, it is more sound physically than half the brand new buildings that we've put hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars into. Like they say, they don't make them like that anymore. However, I think this is a very good article that's been overlooked because I know from uh, people who go there to the senior center that there's been a history of, shall we say, not being clean, peeling paint, and other things of that nature. Also, I can remember earlier in, oh, maybe eight or 10 years ago, that building has a slate roof, which very few people can afford now. And chunks of the slate were falling. And they were chunks about that thick and could have been dangerous. And I think we had difficulty engaging someone who was an expert in slate roof repair. But that is the kind of thing we can't let us let get away. And I think the interior deserves the same care. So I will very definitely support this. And I just hope that we will be able to have enough funds to cover everything. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. McCabe. Harry McCabe, Precinct 21. Uh, the, the Adult Day Health Center uh, 
adult day care center is no longer a resident uh, in the senior center. They have uh, uh, moved down to uh, Broadway. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wagner. Uh, point of order, am I the last speaker? Yeah. Pass. Pass, thank you. Mr. Loretti. Moderator Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I appreciate the previous speakers uh, raising the issue of the uh, new Central School Fund, and I have a couple of questions about that. Um, did I hear someone say that the, expend the monies that go into these funds are expended at the discretion of the Board of Selectmen? Mr. Um, <coughs> Chapdelaine, who controls these monies? The, the revolving funds after being authorized by town meeting are expended at the discretion of the town manager. I'm not sure if, if someone had said they'd been expended at the discretion of the selectmen or not. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering about the, um, the jurisdictional relationship of the central school fund with the redevelopment board. Um, I recall reading the town meeting vote that established that urban renewal plan, and, and it laid out fairly specifically how those funds were to be used and how they were to be managed by the redevelop redevelopment board. And as, as I recall, they were supposed to be segregated um, and, they were, and then the redevelopment board was, was responsible for um, you know, running the buildings and then the excess would be, would be turned over to the town. And it's, I guess it's not clear to me looking at this um, whether the, the establishment of this fund respects the way that the urban renewal plan was established for the central school under the jurisdiction of the redevelopment board. And I guess, I guess my question would be, was, was that um, a town meeting action that goes back you know, many, in a number of decades really considered when this fund was proposed? Yeah. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. I, I guess the, the best way I can answer that question is, is that the, the urban renewal plan has expired uh, so there needed to be the, a legal means of uh, both accepting and then expending the revenue and, and expenditures. Uh, so this revolving fund will be, continue to be managed by the Planning and Community Development Office. Um, and so in practical terms, um, there, there won't be any changes, but um, I, don't, I don't believe the, the terms set forth in that urban renewal plan, uh, urban renewal plan are, are in effect any longer. Thank you. I guess that, that prompts another question is, is, if the urban renewal plan has expired, is, are the, is the building still under the jurisdiction of the redevelopment board? I believe until we turn it back to somebody else, it oh, remains okay. ours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nope, nope. Lady behind you, Paul. <laughs> you didn't even give me a chance to say the new lady. Serena Memon, Precinct 21. I just have a couple questions on this white goods recycling. I don't understand what that means. Can somebody clarify that for me? And also library vend. What's your question, ma'am? The question is, what does white goods recycling um, involve, and what does a library vend? Is that a vending machine at the library? Mr. Chapdelink, can you uh, the, so, uh, Adam Chapdelink, town manager. Uh, the library vend is di directly, as I understand, related to the vending machine in the library and the, the cost of, main, uh, of that machine and the revenue the machine takes in. The White Goods uh, Fund is in regards to the, uh, the pickup and uh, the charge and pickup program for um, uh, a washer, dryer, and I believe also uh, TVs from home. So there's a fee charge to oh, pick okay. that up, and then that uh, takes care of the disposal charge. Okay. Um, also, I was I'm wondering why um, Gibbs School Energy and Cemetery Chapel Rental are on there because they have a balance of zero on the beginning and uh, the balance. Um, so I, I don't know if there's an explanation on that. The Adam Chapdelaine Town Manager, the Cemetery Chapel Revolving Fund was established at last year's town meeting. And the, the, those balances are as of the end of last fiscal year, so last uh, calendar year, June 30, 2011. So at that point, it had just been established by town meeting, and no, receive, uh, no receipts had been received yet. Okay. And the Gibbs School Energy just, I mean, had funds, receipts, and expenditures balanced out. Oh, just curious about that. that. That fund was established to be able to collect 
um, from the tenants of the Gibbs schools to pay their portion of the utility costs. Oh, yeah. So that should be a direct correlation every year between th them paying the actual utility costs and us paying the utility out of the revolving fund for those costs. All right, Co comes very close to the maximum. So, all right, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. Berger. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Eric Berger, Precinct 6. Um, I, I support Article 37, and I think Mr. Jameson's uh, recommendation that, that next year we see what the expenditures, uh, more detail about what the expenditures are for each of these funds makes a lot of sense. And I'm concerned that next year when we get an article to support um, the revolving fund funds, that we won't have that. Or how, how will we get that? I'm not sure. Because it makes a lot of sense. I'd like to know, you know, what, what the money was spent for, rather than just a line item, as, as Mr. Jameson pointed out. I think it would be a good, a good um, you know, improvement. But I'm afraid it won't happen. Or uh, how will it happen? Does anybody know how that, would, that change would be so that next year's report would include uh, what the expenditure is, uh, you know, included? Mr. Chaplain, I believe he's asking if you can give us a more detailed report next year that breaks down the subcategories within each budget. Or at least the expenditure one. Adam Chaplain, Town Manager, we, we can certainly take a look at what, um, what kind of format we could produce so that uh, there could be more detail available. All right. Okay, thank you. Man, these, we're going to start killing more and more trees. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schleckman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under all uh, 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 matters under this article. Okay. Motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Debate is terminated. We have a force a recommended vote for revolving funds and establishing a new fund, a cap the central school rental fund. All in favor of this, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Unanimous vote. That disposes of Article 37. We have now before us Article 38. Collective bargaining. Mr. Tosti. At the current time, uh, the town manager is in negotiations with the various town unions. Uh, at this point, there are no agreements, uh, and there might not be before the town meeting dissolves. Uh, but in case agreements are raised, I would like to move to table this uh, and bring it back up either when we have agreements or at the end of town meeting. So I move to table Article 38. All in favor of tabling 38, please say yes. yes. Opposed? It is tabled. That brings us to Article 39. Position reclassification. Uh, if any come, report next page. I think we also received something on our chairs from the Ms. Coyne, was that Ms. Cove? Did she give us position reclassification? Yeah. Oh, Ms. Malloy. Oh, she changed her name. We also received a memorandum today about position reclassification. Does anyone wish to speak to this article? Adam? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. This article contains the incremental cost increases based on changes made to the paying uh, classification plan. Uh, this is when um, uh, a, a particular position is reevaluated based on the current duties and responsibilities compared to the duties and responsibilities that had been classified at before, and it goes through a process through the Director of Human Resources and then to the Personnel Board, um, and ultimately uh, either can be uh, denied or, if approved, comes before a town meeting for uh, approval of a, a reclassification of the position. Anyone wish to speak to Article 39? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Say no. Unanim oh, near unanimous. Positive vote. That brings us to disposal of Article 39. Brings us to 40. Appropriation town budgets. Um, Mr. Tosti and I discussed this during the break. Seeing it's the late hour of 10.15, we thought we would pull the meeting, see if they wanted to pass the budgets and start it tonight. We can debate them a whole full night and
just continue on through some other articles after that. So Mr. Tosti is going to put your prerogative to the meeting to see if they want to do that. Mr. Tosti. Yes, because uh, usually the budgets take a half a night or, or sometimes longer. Uh, and if we start now, we've only got about 45 minutes. And then on Monday, we have the special town meeting and the capital budget. And uh, uh, so I, to you know, if you want to start the budgets, fine. You know, that'd be fine. Uh, but just to test how you feel, I move to table Article 40. All in favor of tabling 40, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. I believe Article 40 is tabled. Ha uh, ha. You really? No. Um, oh. All in favor of adjourning at 1015, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It's a negative vote. Don't make that motion again, please. Ladies Article and gentlemen, 41. What, what I'm going to suggest is that there's a couple more budgets that we could set aside, like the Minuteman budgets, you know, be next Wednesday. The capital budget, I'm going to move that we set aside till Monday because the special town meeting articles and the capital budget are very intertwined. Uh, and once we get through those, we can go through a lot of these other articles, uh, discuss and decide on them because they sort of stand alone. Uh, so I would suggest that we postpone Article 41, the capital budget, uh, to May 7th, which is next Monday, so we deal with that and the special town meeting uh, at the same time. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It is postponed. That brings us to Article 42. Uh, Article 42 and 43 are uh, articles that we deal with each year. Uh, it basically allows the Treasurer, with the approval of the Board of Selectmen, to borrow certain sums of money that they do through the Mass Water Resource Authority. Uh, on an interest-free basis, uh, and then those loans are paid back through the water and sewer budget. So move favorable action. Well, uh, it's already before you. Article 42, uh, be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Anyone? Oh, Mr. O'Brien. Um, just a couple of questions out of curiosity after hearing um, a lecture in Arlington's water uh, last year. Um, do, is, is Arlington required to um, spend a certain amount of money every year because of a lawsuit brought by the state to repair the sewers? Um, I guess this would be a question for the Director of Public Works. Mr. Rademacher? Thank you, uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. We are uh, in an agreement with the um, Department of Environmental Protection to perform uh, sewer improvements each year until we get through a certain program which encompasses the entire town. Um, approximately how many years will it take to uh, complete the uh, repairs of the sewer system? It, currently, it's proposed as a 12 to 14 year program of which we're four years into it. Um, does the, does Arlington's, uh, water pipes, uh, water pipes leak? I mean, is there a certain percentage of leaking that occurs in our water, our pipes? Yes, there, the water system in Arlington, like many communities, is, um, somewhat aged and there are leaks. Um, and it also is our, 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 would you, in your opinion, would you say our storm drain, drains, are, are, the, are they um, perhaps, um, say, during a rainy period over, over are they sufficient enough? Or do, uh, they, I'm do they need repairs? They, we do have to do periodic repairs to the storm drain. Uh, storm drainage is, is adequate for typical rain events, but when we're inundated with um, a, a less frequent, more intense storm, they sometimes are over capacity, but that's not a f necessarily a fault of the storm drain, but just the, the fact that we can't accommodate every storm. 
Uh, is it possible that there's cross-contamination of sewage and rainwater into the leaking pipes? There is, a, there is the potential, yes. Arlington is fortunate that we don't have a combined sewer and storm drain system like uh, a few of our neighboring communities, but due to the aged system of both the sewer and the storm drain, there are occasions where you might get cross-contamination, and we do deal with that on a fairly regular basis, making repairs of that nature. Um, I was under the impression that I thought it was sewer or water, one of those repairs if we do it at the rate we're doing now, it would be close to 100 years. I guess I'm wrong about that. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. There are, if we were to repair our entire sewer system and the water, and the, water the pipes that all need replacing, it would be close to about 100 rate years at the rate we're going now? Our, our, I think maybe what you're referring to is the, the water system. We do. We have about 100 to 120 miles of water pipe in the, in the streets. And current funding allows us to replace about a mile a year. So, yes, if at a rate of a, replacing a mile a year, you would be take you over 100 years to replace all the water line. But um, some some lines we're finding last longer than that. So we we're, we're working on the more problematic areas currently. Um, so, but approximately right now, how much leakage do we have? Would you say the water that comes in Arlington? How much just goes away as leaks? We have a, um, and it's not necessarily attributed to leaks, but we have what is a uh, unaccounted for water. So uh, what the community receives from the MWRA minus what we sell to residents and businesses, we have approximately, it varies from year to year, but it can anywhere be 27 to 30 percent unaccounted for water. Uh, that could be attributable to many things, leaks. Um, a metering system that's a, a little bit more antiquated that isn't registering all the water that we're selling, uh, but it's something that we uh, strive every year to try to reduce that number. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I urge very much that, that we uh, pass this article. It's just a Band-Aid, um, and, and we're not the only town that's in this situation, but uh, we do, uh, a lot of water is wasted. Uh, there is the danger of cross-contamination. And uh, I think that this is actually fairly urgent, and uh, I recommend that we uh, pass this article. Thank you. Mr. Judd, did you wish to speak? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Lyman Judd, Precinct 9. I don't pretend to be the town historian, but this is a very important article. We had a fire at the Crosby School, I believe it was of 1955. I was in the junior high east at the time looking over. And the fire department got there very quickly, connected up their hose, and they found that all of the pipes going down Oxford Street and Winter Street were down to about this size from calcification and to be plain about it, I could have spit further than some of those hoses were doing. But what they then had to do was run hose lines all the way out to Mass Ave and Broadway. And as a result, the fire did get a little bit of a head start on them. But they were able to extinguish it without losing the whole school. And fortunately, there were no, none, of the, none of the children were injured. But this is the kind of thing that started us on a program of the fire department flowing every hydrant at least once a year to make sure that they were getting proper volume and pressure. Because we don't want to get into a situation like that again where unbeknownst to us, because the water usage is so low, that some of the pipes, because of pelled up of lime, uh, calcium, whatever you want to call it, make the pipes and the flow rate so much smaller that it's a danger and as far as fire protection. So I hope that we will pass this, and I hope also that uh, if we have to borrow or issue bonds or notes, that we can do it at a very low rate. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fiore? Elsie Fiori, Precinct 2. I had uh, also not intended to speak, but uh, for years I used to wonder why we had the 
um, articles in for extending the sewer and water pipes, and and uh, I finally came to understand that it had to be done because we didn't have enough as the town grew. But uh, a big problem now with the sewers and construction of sewers and water is that um, the combined sewer overflows down along Airwife Brook are not all going to be closed. I've said this at town meeting, I think, earlier. Uh, the um, I think at least four are going to be left open. Uh, they're building a in, on the Cambridge side what they're calling a detention pond. It's actually going to take all the drainage from West Cambridge, which is going to come into this little uh, so-called uh, holding pond. But uh, my understanding from a friend in uh, Cambridge, he says that's not going to take care of all of the sewer uh, water that goes through the uh, pipes because uh, they'll, uh, people think it will just go right out to Deer Island. But my understanding uh, from the gentleman from Cambridge is that it'll only run for 12 hours to take out the sewage and uh, water that we don't want, and uh, the other 12 hours uh, there'll still be sewage in the water. I'm sorry if I'm not making myself uh, clear, but I think the bottom line, I personally would like to see uh, some kind of a meeting that perhaps uh, could be set up by the engineer and, uh, so that we would be able to see the connection and what we need to do, particularly down around uh, our wife Brook, where we have all that building, and other places like over on uh, near the Mystic Lake, because there's plenty of sewage coming in, and uh, the other towns, well, Belmont does care, but they may be forced to hook up the new um, building that's going up on the old FACER site to their sewer system. So we got plenty of trouble coming down the line, and uh, if uh, if our town officials could uh, set up some kind of a meeting for those of us who are interested, I think we could get a few people to come and maybe we would understand better seeing it on a map and hearing some discussion where we're not limited in time about this problem. It's a serious problem. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Deist? I know one else wishes to speak to the article. We have, of course, a recommended vote. <clears throat> uh, the Finance Committee. One million dollars for sewer pipes. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Positive vote. That brings us to Article 43. Oh, it's a two-third vote? Oh, sorry about that, Juliana. Um, it's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Madam Clerk, do you declare that 85 members of the meeting are here present and voting in the affirmative? Thank you. Article 43, the same thing except for verse. This is money for water pipes and not sewer pipes. Um, anyone wish to speak to this article? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Positive vote, unanimous. Uh, Ms. Madam Clerk, do you declare 85 members of present in voting? Yes. In the positive, yes. Thank you. Article 44, appropriation for court judgment at Minuteman. Oh, is this one we're going to put off to Minuteman Day? Yes. In line with what I said at the beginning of the town meeting uh, about Minuteman, uh, Superintendent will be here uh, next Wednesday. I move to postpone Articles 40 through 44 through 46 to May 9th. All in favor of postponing 44, 45, and 46 to May 9th, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? They are postponed. Article 47. Uh, this is an article uh, where the school department is building up a special education reserve. I, I'm sure you've heard several times that uh, uh, special education costs can vary dramatically from one year to the other because of uh, students moving in or students moving out uh, of the town. And what the school department is trying to do here uh, is set aside money that they have left over at the end of the year for um, for a special education reserve so they could handle some of these ups and downs. Uh, the school department now is trying to figure out or trying to calculate how much money will be available to transfer and this is uh, you know by the end of the year so at this point they don't have a number 
to put in here by the end of the town meeting uh, they should or maybe even before then therefore I'd like to move to table article 47 all in favor oh excuse me yep all in favor of tabling article 47 please say yes yes article 48 Appropriation Committees and Commissions. We have for us a recommended vote of the Historical Commission. Uh, give a bunch of money to a bunch of different commissions and things. Anyone wish to speak to this article? Nope? Okay. Article 48, recommended vote. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed, say no. Unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Article 49. Appropriation Town Celebrations, uh, Parade Fund, Placing Flags on the Graves of Veterans. Um, anyone wish to speak to this article? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Positive vote, affirmative, unanimous, I so declare it. That closes 49. We have now before us Article 50, Appropriation Miscellaneous. We have before us a recommended vote of the Finance Committee Spend ten thousand eight hundred thirty-nine dollars. Anyone wish to discuss Article Fifty? Seeing none. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed. It's a positive vote. Unanimous. I so declare it. Unanimous. Article Fifty-One. Appropriation. Water Bodies Fund, recommended vote of the finance, $50,000 for water bodies, maintaining and treating oversight of the town's water bodies. Anyone wish to discuss ponds? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Article 52, appropriation signage for historic sites. Um, we have Mr. McKinney. We have, uh, did the selectmen wish to... Oh, where'd she go? Clarissa wanted to make a, a motion, an amendment, I think, to this. Yeah. Okay. You want to pre just present the article? I thought there was an amendment coming, but... Angela Olszewski, Precinct 17, and Chair of the Arlington Committee on Tourism and Economic Development. Um, Clarissa Rowe is on our committee, and she worked um, a lot on this article. She's not here this evening. I don't think we anticipated that. I'm actually not sure why, but I don't think we anticipated that all the budgets were going to be tabled and that what's going to come up tonight. So I respectfully ask for town meeting's indulgence to table this article. Table. Table. Just throw it on the table. Okay, Article 52, motion to table. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Okay, it is tabled. Article 53. Um, we have before us a recommended vote for no, no action. For the FinCom, all in favor of no action on the 53, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is no action. Uh, Article 54. Appropriation parking paid study. Uh-oh. Jeez, we didn't expect to get there, huh? Yeah. Um, we're going to... Mr. Dunn, the new lady had an amendment. We didn't expect it to come up to next week, but go ahead, Mr. Dunn, present your article. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to invite uh, Carl Wagner, who was the original proponent of this article, to come forward and speak about it. No, no, fin FinCom has no action, and Board of Selectmen has a substitute. You have to actually put your substitute in. It's in the Selectmen's report. They have a recommended right. vote. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, I move that we substitute motion under Article 54, which is in the Selectmen's book, page 17. The town meeting hereby recommends the town manager and board of selectmen study whether to implement paid on-street parking in town business districts. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, uh, I'll again ask Mr. Wagner to come up and speak. Uh, we considered spending some money to do a study about how we would implement parking meters. But then we said, wait, uh, but then after discussion with the finance committee and other groups, they said, well, what if town meeting actually doesn't want to put those parking meters out there? We shouldn't spend the money on the study first. 
So we're going to be seeking the town meeting's opinion about whether we should be looking into this or whether we should just let the, uh, or we should pursue other ways to talk about parking in the town. Wait a second. We're ready. Um, Earl Wagner, Precinct 11. Uh, is it too late to, for me to ask the body to table the discussion until May 9th? May 9th? You want to or Until the next session after the special election? Oh, after the special... The special, special meeting. Oh, man. Um, well, you're making a motion. I'll, do we have a second of his motion? All in favor of t tabling? You want to postpone to May 9th? Postpone, thank you. He wants to postpone to May 9th. All in favor of postponing to May 9th, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Hmm. Chairs in doubt. Let's try that again. All in favor of postponing, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. I believe it's not postponed. All right. Well, in the interest of uh, being direct, I am a uh, longtime resident of Arlington. I grew up here. Uh, we do not have parking meters on places like Mass Ave, the three main business districts. Uh, after listening to the discussions about uh, how town could run better and looking at how some of our neighboring towns, Lexington, Belmont, some others, uh, have uh, over the years put in metering of parking, I decided that uh, in, in line with trying to run things as well as possible, we should determine as a town if we want to have par parking metering. I also uh, made a trip a couple of years ago to Montreal and I liked how they did it, but I'm not an expert in parking so I wouldn't recommend myself that we do that. So uh, I called around to the town officials and to people that I thought would have uh, interesting views and perspectives on parking and I generally got the sense that yes it's something that uh, would make sense to bring up now but we want to decide such a big question as do we want to change from free parking in currently marked spots on Mass Ave to non-free parking by bringing such a uh, question to you the Democratic representatives of Arlington. Um, however, I would like to cede my time that's remaining to, um, I think, the town manager to give a sort of more official uh, discussion of that, and I hope that you'll listen to him. Thank you. Well, we generally don't cede time, but uh, keep it real quick, Adam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah ceding time isn't something we do. Uh, Adam Chaplin, town manager. Uh, very briefly to build on what Carl said, a as he said, he had the, um, the thought of uh, filing this motion, or excuse me, filing this warrant article, uh, and he spoke with me as well as some of the selectmen uh, in regards to the parking concept. Uh, coming out of a discussion based upon the technology, the parking, uh, pay for parking technology that currently exists in the town's two parking lots, uh, which have metered parking, uh, there, there had been some initial research uh, into the technology that could be used. Uh, so there are various types of technology that the town could consider, uh, whether it be individual meters or uh, pay by space uh, at one centralized terminal, pay and display where you put a tag back on your windshield or you, or you don't go back and put a tag on your, your, your windshield, you just uh, type the parking spot that you're typed into. So there's, there's a lot of options. But I think in, in terms of um, Mr. Wagner's uh, approach, there'd be several key principles we, uh, principles we want to look at with any uh, parking research or parking study we would do. We'd want to view the town's parking and its business districts as an asset um, of, of the town and how to best utilize and best maintain uh, that asset through the possible generation of revenue and how to also possibly use that revenue to turn back into further development or upkeep or maintenance of a business district or, um, or wherever the paid parking was. Uh, an another principle, um, would be uh, making sure through any study that we work with the Chamber of Commerce and the tenants in any business district such that we were confident that uh, we would be putting in a system that would increase churn and would benefit the businesses located in a business district um, so that there would be um, you know, no, no negative effect on businesses just for the sake of revenue. Um, so I think that's all I would uh, add to the discussion at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gorman, you're next, Dale. It's fine, yes, we Hi, Maureen Gormley, Precinct 20. I'm here with my other hat on tonight, which is on the executive board of the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. Um, about a month ago, I did a survey of the businesses in Arlington. Um, I asked that the three business districts, this is in, of our chamber members, so this is not of all the businesses in town, but as an informal survey, 
the three districts, I asked them, are you in favor of on-street parking on Mass Ave? 72% said no. Their, their idea is that this would interfere with their businesses, and right now they're very concerned about the turnover and everything else with the streets and how they're going to be able to maintain their businesses. We do want to work with the businesses to try to remind them that they themselves should not be parking in front of their own business, which we do remind them on occasion and things of that nature. Um, we do want to see that there is a better flow of traffic because that's what is so unique about Arlington. We are not Cambridge where people have to pay for parking. People can come in, grab something quick and, and leave, um, but we also have a parking lot for people who want to stay longer in the different districts. Um, actually, only in the center do we have paid parking. In the Heights and in East Arlington, we do not. Um, if you want to have a study, that's fine, but I'm just giving you right now what uh, an initial response from chamber members have said. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tosti? Hey, it didn't start. This is an uh, important issue for the town, and the Finance Committee went, went back and forth on uh, appropriating money for a paid parking study now. Uh, these studies can get quite expensive. I mean, we're talking 50, maybe even 75,000. And the Finance Committee didn't want to appropriate any money unless there was the will of the town to move towards uh, implementing parking meters on it. So that is the reason for our no action vote. Uh, however, I think you know, the, uh, the purpose of the selectmen is trying to get feedback, and I think the Finance Committee have no uh, problem with the selectmen's uh, motion. Uh, to try to get feedback on this. I think that, uh, you know, having parking meters is not just a revenue producer, but it also, like the previous speaker said, keeps turnover going in the business district. Uh, and if you have turnover in the business district, you have more people parking there. And also the revenues from these can often help improve the bus business district. So paid on-street parking has several benefits um, uh, for the businesses there. So again, uh, you know, we have no objections to the uh, Board of Selectmen's motion. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I like coffee. i particularly fond of the coffee at Cabrata, which is <laughs> located next to the Capitol Theater in East Arlington. Best coffee in town. They also have chocolate croissants that are to die for. Mm -hmm. I will often program my route to work going out of my way to go down Mass Ave to pass by Cabrata to get a coffee and a sinfully wonderful croissant on my way to Route 2 to head west toward Lowell. Unfortunately, there are often times when my desire for a Cobrata chocolate croissant cannot be fulfilled because I cannot easily park in the vicinity of Cabrata in the morning hours. Now, we do have parking enforcement that comes through to enforce the two-hour rules over there. However, the first pass of the parking enforcement official is merely with the old-fashioned technology of long stick with chalk. So we are now paying a parking enforcement official charged with enforcing the two-hour limit to walk the length of the town marking tires before he can come back two hours later and actually see if somebody is parked in excess of two hours. This is a densely populated municipality. We're, we're not Acton. We're not Carlisle. We're not a town like that. We are among the 10 most densely populated municipalities in the state, and we do have a parking issue. And we do not manage our resources wisely. It is counterintuitive to go and make the premium parking on the avenue free and the supplemental parking in the lots, the satellite lots in the center, metered. 
It makes no sense to have minimal enforcement on the avenue and surrounding streets, but aggressive enforcement in the municipal lots because with the meters, they're easy to enforce. The system is broken. We need to do something to fix it for the vitality of the businesses. Also for the occasional croissant. <laughs> we are not dedicating ourselves to installing parking meters next week, next month, or even within the next year. We also have a previous study that was done a couple of years ago regarding the East Arlington Business District, which talks about effectively managing parking resources. We have plenty of data. What this is telling our town manager to do is to say, okay, we're open to the idea. Let's take a look at what the equipment is, what the resources available are, what the potential benefits might be, and investing the money from the meters back into the business districts to make them more attractive would be a benefit. Having open parking spaces when you want to go to a business would be a benefit. There are many benefits that we can see down the road, but we can't see them if we don't at least tell the town manager that we want him to go and look around, see what's available, see what might work for us, replace those awful meters in the municipal lots, which everybody hates, side benefit, and go forward with a study that just considers the possible improvements by managing our parking resource better. This is a common sense article. Please vote in favor. Ms. Maimon? Serena Memon, um, Precinct 21. I'm here uh, in support of Article 54, but I'd like to see an amendment to it. Um, should I give you the amendment now? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to... Um, see a study that would um, help us uh, figure out how efficient the, the parking meters are. Um, considering that they're mostly on Mass Ave, um, I don't think we really generate that much money. And the parking garage, uh, parking lot that we have is l also limited. I've seen people come to the selectmen's meeting and complain there's no parking for uh, residents in this town. So I'd like to see a proposal to see if we can um, add a, a, a garage in the study for this paid parking study. It would also improve the vitality of the businesses um, in the center and um, make us more um, efficient in, in our um, meters and collections. So I think what you, you, yeah, well, let me read what her amendment is gonna say. She and I discussed this during the break. We surely didn't expect to get to it tonight. So I'm going to accept her amendment because it is going to be very simple. After the words paid on street parking, we're going to carry it in and or a parking garage in the center of town or just in town and or a parking garage. Do we have a second on that? Second. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. So she wants to add parking garage to the... Yes, sir. No, no, she's trying to amend the... Oh, hold on a second. You're bringing up whether it's scope. Okay. Now, let me look at that then. Parking meters are similar instrument currently. No, no, hold on. I'm thinking. I got to read. I'm a slow reader. I will vote to appropriate funds, investigate, and paid parking. Parking meters in a, and selected currently marked. 
Yeah, um, Mr. Oster is correct, madam. That would be out of scope. Um, so we can't do that. But when they do meet and have their study, you can go and bring that up to them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oster, for your scope. Okay. Uh, Mr. Warden is next on the list. So these are done. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, John Warden, Precinct 8. Uh, those who've been around for a while we remember when we did used to have parking meters on Massachusetts Avenue. And, um, uh, and perhaps on Broadway as well. Um, and um, uh, I thought that one of the, the best things that former manager Don Marquis did during his long tenure here was abolishing the parking meters on Massachusetts Avenue. <clears throat> the um, and and you know if you and I sometimes do have to go to Lexington because if you want to buy a pair of shoes, for example, you can't get that in Arlington, and there are many other things you have to go out of town for. And then you've got to fish in your pocket see if you've got a quarter or two quarters or whatever it is. Um, and um, it's it, it it is a nuisance, and I, I can't believe that it's that much of a revenue raiser for the town. As far as the municipal lot is concerned, several people have spoken about that, and uh, that's, th 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 that, that strikes me as the worst possible type of, of parking arrangement, because you, you finally find a place, and then you say, well, now how do I pay for this? And you, you, you walk a very long distance, you get to a machine, but it's out of order. <laughs> so then, well, then you, you go look for another machine, and hopefully that one is in order. Then you try to remember where your car is. <laughs> and, you know, meanwhile, you've used, you, you, maybe the, the, the officer has come around already giving you a ticket because it spent so long to try to get the thing. So that, that uh, system in the, uh, in the behind St. Agnes there, that, that, that really ought to be fixed. And it's really best to have, if you're going to have meters, have one place, one meter, and we had an awful experience in Ireland once. That we, 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 we parked, we parked in, a, in a, what is that place with a trolley, and we wanted to take my mother-in-law in to see the rose gardens, which are very famous. And there was a sign up that said, "Disc parking in effect." And I said, what "The heck is disc parking?" So we parked the car. We went in there. We looked at the roses. They had about 40 different kinds of roses. It was lovely. We came back out. There was a ticket on the car. I said, "Oh God." And, and so, so we, 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 we called up the municipality and said, you know, we, we didn't know about this and we had my elderly mother-in-law here and, well, you have to pay the ticket and if you don't, we'll, we're going to send it to the rental company and they'll really get after you. So eventually I had to pay the ticket and I found out that disc parking is you're supposed to go somewhere, put your money and you get a disc and you hang it on the car somewhere and then they don't give you a ticket. So I hope we don't do that kind of system, but the, the, the point is, the, the, don't t take everything from Ireland, but the point is, if, if you're, going to have a, you're going to have a parking system, you, you really ought to have the facility for paying for the parking where it is. But the main point is, it's a, it's a tremendous convenience, despite Mr. Schlickman's inability to get um, coffee. Now, if, if I needed Kibata coffee in one of those uh, croissants, um, I would uh, just get off the bus and at, at the Capitol. Uh, uh, well, the bus would take me into North Station, the train would take me to Lowell. Um, well, uh, the, the, the point is, we tried parking meters. We've decided as a municipality a, long, uh, a while ago, we didn't like parking meters. We wanted to be rid of them. I think we should listen to the lady who spoke to the members of the chamber who said they thought it would be a detriment to their businesses. Uh, I think generally they are a nuisance. I think they're a small revenue item for the town, and I think we should not even have this study. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ms. Stamps. Uh, I'm Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. and. Um, in Precinct 3, it's East Arlington, Capitol Square area. So a lot of my constituents are, uh, would be directly affected 
by having parking meters. And I will tell you that the business owners that I've spoken to would really like to see parking meters on Mass Ave in East Arlington. And here's why. You've got a lot of small shops. Um, they don't have a lot of people in them. And the business owners that I've spoken to complain about um, the fact that there are um, people in East Arlington who leave their cars on Mass Ave all day long. And they leave their cars in front of other people's shops. Um, and in particular, I spoke to a woman who runs a really great uh, funky women's clothing shop in East Arlington. And I walked in there one day, it was very quiet, and I said, well, geez, where's, uh, where's all your customers? This is such an awesome shop. And she said, uh, people, people come in and they complain to me that they, if they've been driving around for 20 minutes trying to find a parking place. And they finally parked two or three blocks down the street. Um, you know, some of their, their customers are older, they don't want to park that, that far away. So um, I don't know who the members of the Chamber of Commerce were that um, the person who got up and spoke with. I wonder if a lot of them are people who have you know, law firms, accountants, whoever, who have businesses on the second story, and they like the idea of leaving their cars all day um, on the street. But for the people who have shops, who have walk-in customers, parking, lot, uh, parking meters would be a big um, help to their businesses, and I hope that you vote in favor of this article. Mr. Smith, Scott. Scott Smith, Precinct 5, uh, just speaking as a town meeting member, not on behalf of any committee. Um, I'm planning to vote in favor of this because it's just meaning looking at the issue and when I drive and try to find parking in the center or anywhere else, there are plenty of improvement opportunities in this town's parking system, uh, library, whatever. Uh, and that's all it is, looking at the issues. But one thing we found is uh, Parking, changing how you do parking requires a fair bit of political will. So I think, you know, vote how you feel about this and that will be impact what, give some indication whether the political will is there to do anything. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Lavetti. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Um, Ms. Moderator, I'm a, a little bit confused about what we're doing here because originally this was a, an appropriation um, which the Finance Committee voted no action on, and the article still in the Selectman's report calls an appropriation paid parking study, but I don't see any sum being appropriated. And what I'm trying to figure out is, are we appropriating funds for this study, or are we going to get the free labor of the town manager and the Board of Selectmen? Looks like they're going to do the study for free. I don't see any money associated with this article. Somehow they're going to fund it out of their internal budgets. Is that correct? No money. Adam Chapdelain, town manager. No, there's no appropriation being requested in this article. However, uh, approval of this article uh, will allow us to go forward, uh, get, uh, go further in a process of determining what a potential parking study might cost, how much we can leverage from the parking study that Mr. Schlickman mentioned earlier that had been performed in East Arlington, uh, and then potentially come back for an appropriation request next year, or depending on what the cost would be, um, uh, not come back for an appropriation. But this, this request is not requesting an appropriation. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess just to um, speak a little bit more about the parking study that Mr. Schlickman first alluded to, that was part of a, um, I believe it was called the commercial development study. And at the time, um, it, it was a f fraction of it, maybe 25% or 20% of the funds. And it, it was done, uh, it focused on East Arlington simply because there wasn't enough money available to focus on all of the business districts. And I believe it was done um, with some help from some staff in the planning department. And I, I would suggest that it certainly is worthwhile to continue that type of study in the other business districts in the center and in, and in the Heights, and in particular in the Arlington Center. Um, it would certainly have value. So I would um, ask that town meeting support this article, particularly since there is no appropriation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Romano. 
Mr. Jameson, Mr. Judd. Okay, it's five of. We've got a motion to adjourn. Um, all in favor of adjournment, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No. Okay, we're not adjourning. Um, Mr. Logan. William Logan, Precinct 2. Uh, if they do have a study, I hope that this study will include the impact on the side streets of all the people that will be trying to avoid the meters by parking in front of the resident's house on the side streets. Particularly in East Arlington, that's what people will do. If I can't find a parking space on Mass Ave, I go on the side street, but that's because I can't find parking. But if there's a meter there, I'll, people will probably do that. So I would try to avoid it, but of course. Uh, also, the impact of having to hire more meter maids, I'm sorry, parking enforcement officials, that's what they're called nowadays, to get that right. Uh, would the impact of hiring more of those and having to give them benefits and all that, would that outdo the income need of the town by having the income of the parking meters? Because you need the current ones to do current things like that they're enforcing now. So if they can't enforce those things now by having trouble like Mr. Schlickman is suggesting, we're definitely going to need more of them. So it might outdo the cost effectiveness. Um, also, with the Mass Ave plan, if we're gonna put meters in, wouldn't that affect the current Mass Ave plan? We have a plan set in place uh, that's you know, pretty much set in place, and if we're gonna have meters, wouldn't that affect that? Um, that would be a question I would ask the town, someone in the town, about the uh, meters affecting the plan if they did eventually have them. The planning department, would meters affect your plan for um, Eastern Mass Ave? Carol Kowalski, Director of Planning and Community Development. I don't believe they would. The plan um, has spaces already marked. So I don't, I don't know why it would uh, affect, it could, but I, don't, I can't think of why it would um, affect the, the plan because the spaces are already uh, accounted for in the design. Well, how about the, the placement of the devices? Would that affect the plan? Uh, that's a good question. Although there are so many different methods uh, there too. I don't know why it would, but uh, we could learn a lot from a study, from a, a professional who could inform the town about the different methods of um, paying for parking. Thank you. You're welcome. My suggestion is to place this before the voters and uh, stop it here. And then if the voters decide to, that we should have a committee to study it, then we should do that then. Uh, otherwise, I would suggest voting no. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fisher. Uh, I, I have a distinct memory. Name and Andrew, I'm sorry, Andrew Fisher, uh, Precinct 6. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I have a distinct memory uh, as, your, as one of your two town meeting representatives to the Vision 2020 Standing Committee that the previous town manager had a rather strong feeling that if we went to meters, they should not be a sort of profit center. They should, they should just pay for themselves. Um, Jane Howard might be able to correct me. But at any rate, I, uh, no? Yeah. At any rate, I, I wondered um, if the present town manager has an attitude about that one way or the other, a philosophy about it. And, and is it realistic to really do more than pay for the enforcement officers? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So you're asking if uh, I have a position on whether or not uh, any paid parking would be a break-even? Uh, yeah, as opposed to making money, because it's, it's been alluded to as a way for the town to make money, which um, I, would, I would oppose myself. I, I would answer that by saying uh, my initial position before any study would be performed would be that any, any revenue that would um, be generated above and beyond the cost of operating and implementing the system uh, should be targeted uh, to the neighborhood through some uh, some means. Uh, however, I, 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 I can't say that I would fully agree that, um, I, I don't know that financially it would be, um, I wanna say this, 
M models I've seen uh, would demonstrate to me that it would be more than a break-even process and that there would be revenue generated that could be put in some direction or another. I think his question is, do you want it to generate profit or do you want it to break even? Correct, Andy? Yes. I guess standing here tonight, I would recommend it generate some profit that could be directed to the business district uh, that it's located in. Okay. I, I, was, uh, I just wanted to know. And uh, I'm opposed to this, so I don't want to see them waste a lot of time and then see it voted down next year. So I would, as previous people have asked, v vote what you think rather than and, and just preempt the thing. Uh, thank you. Mr. Fairglue? You can move the question if you want it. Mr. McCorry? I think we're ready. Ready to vote here, you. Move the question. Hugh McCrory, Precinct 20. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, I have a question. Um, the town manager mentioned that uh, there's no appropriation of funds. Is that correct? Say it one more time. There is no appropriation there of funds. There is no appropriation. So I, I'm just looking at this, uh, what we're voting on exactly. Um, and the question is, it says, can, can you explain what exactly we're voting on? We're voting, well, first, we, the sub selectmen have a substitute motion so we re -rec where we, as the body, are recommending that the Board of Selectmen and the manager study whether to implement paid on-street parking. Yep. Okay. That's what we're voting on okay. if yep. we so buy not, that. So not this, not this one. Uh, oh, That's great, it just vote. changed. That's the vote. <laughs> Super. Okay, that, clear, that clears that up. Uh, next quick question. Um, if this passes or fails, uh, What's the impact? Is it enforceable? It's a recommendation we make to the town manager. Is it normal that we, uh, we make uh, policy requests we, we through town the, meeting we to the board of selectmen? We as the board, we at the town meeting cannot direct them to do anything. We can only make recommendations. I think if they're judging a feel of the meeting, whether we are, want to do this or not, yep. I think if That's we say no, they're going to drop the idea. That's if we I'm say yes, this. they're going to go yeah. forward. That's where I'm going with this. Yeah. So uh, I would recommend, uh, like, we, like has been done for the uh, CLAMP project, that uh, a, a public hearing is held or a series of public hearings. I actually agreed a lot with what Mr. Slickman said regarding parking. There's a lot of anomalies in uh, parking in Arlington. Uh, I would also recommend that the two-hour limit uh, could be reduced uh, to stop people parking for long periods of time when they don't really need to park in, the, in those uh, business districts. So uh, thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mr. Berger, yes. feel free to move the question, Mr. Berger. <laughs> Damn it. No, no, we have to wait for the next speaker, Nicole. Ah, you have to stand up, give us your name, say terminate debate. Okay, we have a motion, we have a motion to terminate debate. It's seconded. All in favor of termination debate, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? Okay, the debate is terminated. Now, we have before us the um, selectmen substitute motion in favor of the, instead of the no action of the FinCom, all in favor of substituting the Board of Selectmen's substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Darn it. Chairs in doubt. Um, can we try it again? All in favor of the selectmen substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. My opinion is defeated. Okay, five people arose. Let's stand. All, everybody who wants a substitute, please stand. Um, you want to count for us, Mr. Tosti? Uh, same tellers. Mr. Tosti, up front. Seven in favor. Mr. Schlickman, on the nine in favor, up front. Mr. Schlickman, 18 on the left. Mr. O'Connor. 23. Mr. Trembley. 30. 30. And Mr. McCabe. 23. 23. All opposed, please rise.
Mr. Tosti, any no, any up front? Zero up front, Mr. Schlickman? Eleven. Mr. O'Connor? Sixteen. Mr. Trembley? Eleven. Mr. McCabe? Eleven. The vote is in the positive, 103 to 49. Hold it. Now we have to vote as board, the, the FinCom vote as select as substituted by the Board of Selectmen vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It is a positive vote. Um, okay, we have a motion adjourned. Do we have any notices of reconsideration? Okay, Ms. Fiore, Article 48. Hey, Fiori. 32. Fisher. Any others? No other motions for reconsideration. Mr. Tosti moved on 35, 42, 43, 48, 49, 50, 51, 53. All in favor of adjournment, please say yes. yes. Opposed? We'll see you next Monday.